From the Dice Abide Live studios, it's Late Night War Games with your hosts, Adam and John. Thank you, Jay. And hello, everyone. I'm Adam, but you know me as the Dice Abide. John, what are you drinking tonight? Ooh. <laughs> Your your delicious cheap sake, make it hot, and then it's good sake. <laughs> well, so I'll go on to what I'm having while you're. That should do it. All right, I'm having hot sake, which I'm pretty sure is a is a Grand Theft Auto cheat code. Perfect. Um, tonight I'm having a beer that was given to me by my wife's second cousin's husband which makes him my unrelated second cousin. Yeah, um sure like i'm uh, sure <laughs> and uh we're friends he's about, they're about the same age they have a, a kid about ruben's age hmm. and they got a beer and he doesn't like beer that, that's uh too strong so he gave me his yeah right i do so yahat's brewing golden on raspberries huh okay yeah, it's a oak fermented golden ale with raspberries, which to me sounds delicious, and it's ten percent. So, excellent, excellent. As Lauren would say, it's efficient. Right. Well, cheers. Cheers. Bottoms up. That's really good. It really does just taste like, like um, like raspberries in golden ale. It's the name is on the can. It does the thing. As advertised. Yeah, it's a little cidery. I appreciate that. I'm not yeah. against that. How's your sake? It's uh, warm and alcoholic, like, which is what I want. That's <laughs> the one from, from sake. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's the, uh, the Hakutsu brown bottle, cheapest one on the rack, because they wouldn't let me leave with the expensive one and when I told them I was going to warm it up. So... <laughs> I was on their subscription list for a while. I I still have a few bottles to get through. It's really damn good. Yeah. Oh, this stuff is fantastic. I'm. I mean, like I, this is not bad sake by any means. It's just that they cautioned me to not heat up good sake, and so <laughs> I was like, all right, sure. I mean, I I know what I want, and I'm I'm happy to buy the cheap stuff. Well, excellent. Uh, why don't you go ahead and. Fill us in on some of the news, news, news. News, news, news. Yeah. So just a reminder, uh, we're doing a limited insertion mission over Broman Academy, which means you should play a list with 10, uh, 10 order generating models in it, right? It can be over 10 orders. Um, and let us know how it went, right? So in this edition, you lose the ability to protect yourself from being docked to orders if you only have a single mm -hmm. combat group. But that's okay, because you can probably find some orders elsewhere via Attack Aware, NCO, or Lieutenant Level 2, that sort of thing. Um, it's, I like your selection of Akari Company models right there. Yeah, I uh, that was what I planned to take to the Biotech 4 Showdown one year. Uh, that was the year that we decided to peace out from the Biotech 4 Showdown. And we're not oh, bad people right. for leaving a tournament, because we both left, so we didn't ruin, ruin any pairings. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, right there you go. That's that's the way to do it. You know, find a buddy to quit a tournament with. But uh, yeah, that was also the year we ran around trying to find prizes for Rose City Raid. So, uh, but yeah, oh, do, right. do that thing. Um, send in send in a battle report or just your thoughts. It doesn't have to be full battle report. Pictures are always appreciated. Um, all the details are on BrumanAcademy.com. Uh, if you want to take more pictures, you can do it with the painting contest number seven, which we're running with War Garage, and it's all about conversions. So the rule here is if somebody familiar with the original model uh, can tell you've done something to it, then it's a conversion. It counts. doesn't have to be a huge thing. You don't have to be Obadiah Hampton. You just need to be able to... Like, arm swap is fine. Right? It just needs to look slightly different than the stuff on the box art. Even if you repose so the arm a bit. so good? You can't tell it's a conversion. There you go. Right? That's has happened to Obi. That's the curse. That's the curse of Obi. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you want to send in four painted pictures and like a few extra pictures of your conversion, like the details of it before you paint it, feel free to do so. Uh, but again, the rule is four painted pictures. Um, so, yep, rules are on the on the website as usual. Uh, new lumbering sprocket mission is up. We're playing coup d'etat, supply raid, and total annihilation, um, which is a great video game, by the way, for us 90 kid, 90s kids. Um, <laughs> And uh, basically, play those missions. Let us know how they went. All the details are on lumberingsprocket.com. 
and uh, you get entered to you win get some, yeah, DreamPod 9 store, store credit. Uh, one thing is that currently we're not, uh, uh, they, you know, they don't want to um, have repeat uh, uh, winners and stuff. So so if you're going to sure. send in mul over multiple months, um, you know, beware that you, we, we certainly appreciate the feedback and the data you're giving us, but you may not be eligible for store credit. If you have questions, please contact me at mailbag at uh, lumberingsprocket.com or late night wargames.com. Either of those things go to the same place. Um, <laughs> if you're looking for heavy gear content, I gave Than a break this week. Uh, so I published a heavy gear battle report instead. So you can go check out uh, a game I played with Than. So he's not entirely off the hook. Uh, we played a, a mission called Eye of the Storm, which he developed. Um, and it's really cool. You basically randomly deploy your combat groups all over the board, and who knows, you might end up six inches away from the enemy and have to deal with that. So that was fun. I had a bunch of Morgana flail behind in Ammon, and you can check out all the details uh, on that battle Ugh. report. It's it's a it's it's a really interesting one. I you know I I can already hear some Grognard saying like, oh, it's not balanced. Well, I mean, yeah, it's random, it's, but we're playing a dice game. There's randomness involved, uh, and I think it definitely ask the question, can you adapt to a unforgiving situation? And um, that's really what I'm looking for in a tournament mission. And if you don't like it, you can harass your tournament organizer to not use it in their tournament. So I think that's totally fine. It's an optional mission that we're probably going to It kind of reminds me of some of the, in, uh, in Warhammer Fantasy, there was a mission that I'm blinking on the name right now, but basically your deployment zone was in thirds mm -hmm. and your different units had to deploy in different thirds. And in Warhammer Fantasy, I would say deployment was more important in that than in, in Infinity. Yeah. Like, 90% of the game happened before the game started. And so it was like, well, welcome to this mission. What if you deployed badly? Can you win? Right. And that is entirely the inspiration uh, behind this mission, as Than was telling me. So that's, uh, so that is exactly what he intended. And I think it does a good job of that uh, without being too random or too unfun. Um, it definitely created for some very narrative moments, which I was, you know, what Heavy Gear is all about, honestly. Um, so, yeah. Good stuff. Good time. Uh, not a huge amount of Infinity news, right? We've had some trickling out from Corvus Belly about the uh, um, Crimson Stone stuff, so you can go check out their YouTube yep. channel if you want to get all the details there. Uh, but not a lot of uh, giant news this week. Uh, we did get some Heavy Gear news, though. Oh, yeah. So they released the both of the uh, the new two-player starter set with Peace River and New Coal. Mm -hmm. And so now there are two two different... Two? Two-player starter sets. There you go. There we go. Um on their store and they are discounted until the 14th so tomorrow uh you've got a little over a day then to get those in if you want to get them for 100 bucks and yep. each one of them i think is i think it's two-thirds of a regular box starter army so it's a pretty good deal for 100 bucks to get yeah. two two-thirds size armies yeah and i mean you you can totally split this with a buddy or just you know later on get it if you're both playing the same faction there's all kinds of options here Great yeah, value. Or though, get two, bottom line. Get two of them. Also great. And then have two good sized Nucle and Peace River armies right at the door. Very, very true. Um, yeah, and we'll talk more about uh, Peace River soon in an upcoming Heavy Gear episode where we talk about uh, how to extend what's in the starter box. All right, that'll be next week. Yeah, exactly. I think. Um, we've got uh, some War Cradle news, right? Going yep. on. Yeah, so they've uh, they've released. You know, these are the models for this month. We've got the Union Constitution Battle Fleet, which looks sweet. Those rotors are pretty nifty. the The battleship is just awesome, though, with the three big heavy guns on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like this kit. I don't know why. I love the paddle boat look. It it really works for me. Sure. I mean, why not? So, so that doesn't, doesn't do it for me. But like, surprisingly, the Ningjing Empire ones kind of do. Uh oh. They're kind of okay. I don't know. We'll see. Uh oh, oh is the right word there. Uh, <laughs> they're 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 a little uh, big trouble, little China for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll see. We'll see. I'm I have <laughs> I have plenty of things to build, so I'm not in, I'm not chomping at the bit or anything. But we'll talk more about dystopian war soon. Um, there's also yep. some more stuff for your faction. Yeah. So this is the uh, the Descartes battle uh, Descartes battle fleet. So this is basically most of the. Uh, what, or a, a portion of what comes in the starter pack for Enlightened. So you've got your Wilpedo battleship at the top there, the Descartes, and then uh, two of the of the the line ship sprues that has each one of them has three of the uh, three of the frigates and one of the cruisers, and it's a modular kit, of course, so you can make whichever of the cruisers you want. Right. 
And then I think they also just came out. There you are with the Imperium support squads. Mm -hmm. So a few more frigates, a couple more specialized cruisers, with big old Tesla guns. And I think there also is a carrier version that you can make out of there as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, hence, I have a bunch the, of uh, Imperium from the old Dystopian Wars days, which never saw the table, sadly. And it's mostly painted, too. So hopefully I'll be able to mix and match. Uh, from what I've seen online, the old stuff and the new stuff matches quite well, uh, design language-wise. And it just definitely yeah. looks like an older generation of ship, which is totally a thing that happens in naval games or navies, period. So right. I think it's totally so, fine. Yeah, it's not it's not as out of place as some people might think. Cause it's, you know, not everything's the latest sculpt, but the old sculpts looked really good. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have some... So we're talking about Dystopian Wars tonight. Uh, but we have some interesting news coming up for future episodes, uh, which is yeah. Where did it go? Oh no, curses! You, uh, 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 oh, back up. Oh. So, uh, Moonstone, they have sent us a two-player starter pack. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, there you go. To, to give a whirl and to try out. So, looking forward to that. The artwork is gorgeous inside, and the models are really nice. Um, I'll probably do an, a short unboxing stream uh, separately one of these days. This picture right here is uh, Kalista, the Paroxysm Edition model. I think it's a, I think it's 54 millimeter. Now I can't remember if this is the 32 mil sculpt for it or if this is the large scale sculpt because they're doing large scale for a couple of the characters for the Kickstarter. Oh, sure. But their backer kit, I believe, is is coming imminently so if you didn't back this on kickstarter and you want to you want to get in on that you know definitely uh, follow them on kickstarter and on their facebook to get access but yeah these models look really cool yeah i'm excited to try it out it's uh got some fun bluffing mechanics which i will probably mean i immediately lose to you but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> it does have really good trolley bluffing mechanics that i it's probably why i like the game so much probably other than the sculpts um and yeah, I mean, the most important thing that comes in here is uh, Doug the Flatulent, who is a goblin knight riding a pug. How can I how can I say no to that? Yep. Seems right up your alley. Just farty pugs. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got some interesting Blood Bowl news. All right, here we go. Uh, Chimpa Limpa Kickstarter. Okay. From Grebo Games. So Grebo makes a line of chibi teams. Yes. Which are all really cute. They've got like the porks for the orcs and all, it's a little tiny chibi pig team. And so they've just put out, I think it's three or four or five different teams you can make from different combinations of the chibis that they've made. Mm. So here's just a, a selection of a bunch of them on here. So you've got like a, a lemur snotling team. So the sloths oh, at the top of the trolls and then these, these sloth pump wagons they made. And the best is the sloth that has been turned into a pump wagon. With mm. its hands tied over its head and it's asleep and it's got a wheel on it. It's adorable, covered in lemurs. With the the lemur sprinters, then the the fungus hoppers are riding tree frogs, and the the ones that throw the 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 mushroom bombs are have bombs on them. All really adorable. Then yeah, the little chimps over there. I believe that is a, a wood elf team in this configuration, but you could also make a uh, a halfling team from it. They've sure. got another whole different set of team with a bunch of gorillas. To then throw them, which make great for ogre teams or black orc teams. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so it's just kind of like a bunch of cute chibi positionals you could make a lot of different teams from. Um, and they're pretty freaking hilarious. And Grebo makes good stuff. So Yeah, their stuff is fantastic. I've I've definitely eyed a lot of their chibi teams and being like, should I? But we don't play oh, enough their Blood Amazon Bowl to... is so good. I know. It's all it's all amazing. Everything they make is great. So yeah, the lemur team is really tempting. I'm like, man, how many unpainted bubble teams do I really need? And the answer is possibly more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you need all of them. Apparently, you you have a you have a Pokemon problem when it comes to Blood Bowl for sure. I've I've held off of some of the teams, not many of them, but some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty. They're pretty cute. They are very adorable. Uh, but so we don't continue. Tempting. Well, yeah. Maybe we can Speaking talk about some other Blood Bowl stuff. That works. That's how it works. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So, so Punga has uh, released. Basically, they came out with their initial, you know, their initial uh, Patreon release of the Snotlings, and the pump wagon is kind of gigantic. 
So the community requested that he make one more in, more in line with the the rest of the uh, the miniatures, so it fits more nicely on the pitch. Oh, sure. So he's come out with a in, with a shortened version that should fit fine. And then I believe also, depending on how many likes or whatever he gets on that post, whatever social button people are supposed to click on that post, uh, likes or shares, he's also going to do a, a fully designed second troll for them as well. Oh, nice. Very cool. So very cool. Glad to see that he's you know continuing to support the team even after the initial release of it. Awesome. Such a good team. I love the, the pot still there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's it for news. Which means it's hobby time. What do we got here? Oh, right. Okay, so first up is uh, Fort Schwarzenegger, <laughs> and this is, this is my objective room that I've been working on for my US Ariadna table. I, you know, when I when I made that table, I got a bunch of these blocks, wrapped them all up in drywall tape to make them look like Hesco barriers, and it worked really well. And then I was gonna I'll do the same thing for a giant objective room, so. The interior of it is perfectly eight inches by eight inches, uh, but the exterior adds another three inches to it because that bottom layer is inch and a half cubes. Sure. So it's like an 11 inch by 11 inch block of terrain that's all modular, so it'll all fit next to my uh, next to my my Hesco barriers. But this one I'm going to make to look like it's made out of big cement blocks that have been stacked into place. Gotcha. Well, I mean, you know, with a name like that, it better be large and in charge. Right, and then I I couldn't resist, but uh, made my own badge for the fort, mm-hmm. which is a silhouette of Arnold Schwarzenegger flexing, of course, overlaid with the uh, U.S. Ariadna badge. That I think I might end up getting patches made for this. I'm not positive, but at the very least, I'm going to have um, well, small badge. What, ba- what you should mm-hmm. do is make badges, uh, patches for it, and then leave two on the table. And if you play on the table, you get to say you were at Fort Schwarzenegger. Right. See, the problem is that then I'm going to end up doing that for all of my tables. I'm like, oh, every table has a personality. Every table needs its own set of patches, and that gets expensive. I don't see the problem with this. That means I get more patches. That seems fine. (laughs) But at the very least, I'm going to make, I'm going to have this uh, this emblem laser engraved, you know, on a disc that I can put over the doors on all four sides of it. Nice. Nice. Maybe I can maybe I can make a stencil out of it and uh, stencil it onto my landing pad. Hmm. There you go. Smart. So, yeah, yeah Fort Schwarzenegger. Yeah. You had so, to think of what, what future president they would get. <laughs> exactly. Well, there you go. What else have you been up to? Yeah, I enlisted the help of Gene and got paint down on most of my uh, most of my table for uh, Eastworld. The only bummer is that since this picture has taken that river, so the, 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 the goop was advertised as it doesn't shrink. But the whole river has been curling really badly. Oh no! Since it's fixed, like, like one the one end is over an inch higher than the other end. Oh goodness. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how to salvage that. I might not have it ready in time for the Rose City raid, but at the same time, this picture is missing the objective room. Right. And it's a pretty dense table as it is. Right. So, uh, I can if, with the objective room. There's plenty of uh, there's plenty of terrain on the table. I mean, we could also just get some pink insulation foam and make some tunnels. As Grizzly yeah, Troll there we is go. saying. Tunnels would, would solve all of my problems. I mean, I think so. Then you can put the patches in the tunnels just to keep them. Like it's, no. it's, it's, a, it's a holding area right, for patches. But yeah, I'm a, little, I'm a little bummed that... Yeah, that it's curling. I'm trying to figure out a solution. Um, the, the material is actually pretty easy to break. Hmm. So I might actually just try to force it in reverse. Oh, and then, like, down, patch, and then, then patch the cracks with extra stuff. Yeah, or something. Mm. Um, either way, that that might get put on the back burner until uh, the end of the turn after the roast. Yeah, raid. makes Sad sense. Base. Yeah, I've got but a lot of still, stuff to do too. Yeah, there's still woods on there. Yeah, yeah there's still special train zones in that. Yeah, mm-hmm. an eight-inch building missing out of the middle. So plenty of terrain either way. Seems reasonable. But maybe maybe no river, which is also I'm okay with. It's like one thing off my plate to have to deal with between now and then. Yeah, I know. Oh. It's sad. It's sad. And then finally, I finished my organized play from home challenge. Mm. And this was a lot of fun, actually. Um, I will probably go back through and add more detail later. 
uh, especially to the the cloak of the Knight of Justice. But I was able to get in the the green cross, just like it is in the artwork on the um, on the, oh, what's her name? the doctor infirmer. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then the big thing here, I was really experimenting with non Caucasian skin tones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So one of the things that drives me nuts about studio paint jobs is like ninety nine percent of the time they're white. Like how many times do you look at a Hawk Islam army and you're like, oh, there's a bunch of white dudes here that are from Hawk Islam. Cool. Um, or you know, same thing with with uh, Pan Oceana, which is supposed to have a lot of like Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe and the the Mediterranean areas involved. And it's like, well, why are why are they all white dudes? So um, I use this as an opportunity, at least on all three models in this picture, to have their faces exposed to do different non-white skin tones. So in the upper right hand corner there, I kind of was looking at photos of um, uh, like Malaysian and uh, Filipino sure. kind of skin tones. And then the upper left, that was a little bit trickier because um, I was trying to get some of the browner. It, it ends up looking African, but I was trying to, I probably needed to get more um, more coppery tones in there, but I was trying to get like South Indian. No, I mean, that that reads as South Indian to me. It doesn't read okay. as, I mean, I mean, I, you could, uh, and especially at this scale, like it's hard to tell. Anyways, it's, I mean, you you, you get confused hard. with the with the actual live human being that was that skin tone, right? So the fact that you're getting yeah. confused by a mini is is, I think, a success. Right, right. So I'm pretty happy with that, and I also it's also a little bit of a of a troll to the people that for some reason think that military orders needs to be like the, the, these white crusaders. Remember, it's like no, they're a bunch of. You know, people from all over the place. Yeah, right. And then, yeah, and then you can't see in the the picture the infirmer has. Um, I kind of I was looking at pictures of Maasai for another reference, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna try to use that skin tone. So nice. kind of mimic that. Um, yeah, I've got this whole set of skin tones I think from Green Stuff World that I use as a good starting places for the different different uh, different colors, and then just knowing how to mix colors kind of added my own blends to it. I mean, if you but if you're like me though, and you can't mix colors because you're bad at things, uh, you can just go over here and buy stuff from Reaper, and you can get things like, oh, I need somebody who's tan. You can get like tan shadow, and then there's tan skin, and then tan highlight, and you've got a tan person oh, done. Perfect. Easy. Very nice. Yeah. So I've I've got a whole paint rack full of skin tones because I I can't mix things. So. Very cool. Everybody yeah, can play so in that sandbox. Have- like just having a lot of fun. Yeah. I really like these models. The sculpts were were pretty entertaining. Very nice. That's my hobby. Uh, I did something different for hobby. I wrote or updated my heavy gear dice roller, and I put it on <laughs> GitHub <laughs> for people to use. So uh, basically, you can find it on GitHub. There's a there's a whole post on dp9forum.com. You can go there and find it. It has instructions, so I won't repeat everything here. But basically, the idea is that uh, it's a Python script. You can find a Python interpreter online in a browser, so you don't need to like install any software or anything. You just cut and paste the script in and run it. Uh, the helpfully named edit me function is where you should focus your attention. Um, you can set up some arbitrary number of experiments, right? So here you see that we're looking at uh, rolling 2d6 on a 3-up, right? So attacker dice, attacker skill versus 3 dice on a 4-up, right? So defender dice, defender skill. And you can set the weapon damage damage, um, armor rating, hull structure, and then you can set all these traits here. So is the defender agile? Is the attacker precise or advanced? Blah, 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 blah. And then when it's all said and done, it will spit out a bunch of columns of all your experiments compared against one another. So you can evaluate which gun is better in which situation. And you can make an informed decision as to what you should do uh, or what you you might want to think about taking. What's that? Finally, it's the question, is a laser cannon better than a rotary laser? Uh, the answer is it depends as it should, which is a good sign of good game design and, and weapon <laughs> diversity, right? So, uh, if you really care about what's going on, you can, you can, uh, you can go past where the, it says on the map here, be dragons and go onto the guts of it and edit it if you desire. Um, if you find I'm, I mean, I'm busy, I'm not going to probably do a lot of support of this, but if you find bugs or have a uh, pull request or something, definitely, um, let me know and I'll take a look. But yeah, so I'm. I'm also. It would be good to see if somebody who's familiar with both Python and the uh, Heavy Gear Dice rule set um, would would uh, you know backstop me and make sure I didn't make any silly errors. I've already found several. So uh, any anything um, 
people people find I'm happy to hear about. It's just uh, I can't promise any sort of like thing approaching an SLA. So yeah, that's what I did for Javi. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a tool that that is useful. You know, when, when we were learning in Infinity, going to the Infinity uh, dice calculator to right. figure out if decisions were good or bad sure. was always a really helpful resource. So starting to build something out like that for Heavy Gear, which has kind of surprisingly complex dice mechanics, mm -hmm. at least, you know, it's not like 40K where you're like, cool, I've got 60 dice rolling threes to hit, so I'm going to hit with like 40 of them. Like, you don't get that. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, well. So these kinds of tools are handy. Yep, it's uh, it's been it was fun writing it. Uh, and one of the things that I wish other dice rollers did is allow you to immediately compare multiple experiments, because that's like sure. the reason you're doing it, right? So the Infinity Dice Calculator, you can do that, but you have to like open two tabs and like juggle stuff back and forth, and then you like forget right. to set mimetism on the first experiment, and you know all your numbers are wrong. You have to go back and do it again. So this one doesn't do that. Um, so yeah, give it a shot. Well, excellent. That means it's time to talk about our games. I like to do games. That's what I like to do. So I played a game. Yep. You played a game. <laughs> uh, we played a game I, of Dystopian Wars, which we'll talk about at length in a minute. Absolutely. Um, but uh, it was a lot of fun, actually. I we actually played several games. We played, uh, I think, the first two missions of the... No, we played like a really simple... like. Yeah, we played three times. Yeah, we played three times in, in one evening. So that's a good sign of how fast the, the game plays for completely brand new players, right? Yeah, never, play, never, never rolled those dice before. Took the dice out of the package for the first time. Yep. Um, I like opened the... I opened the cards like, you know, like scraped the shrink wrap up with a fingernail like that night and everything right. like unsleeved cards uh you, dice yeah, fresh out of quick, the bag like three frigates on three frigates and that's where we learned that my frigates cost more points than your frigates <laughs> yeah <laughs> for, they do for good reason <laughs> and then we played the first two missions of the the hunt for the prometheus campaign mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun uh, but we'll talk about that more in a minute uh i played a game of panic room with eric so um you know, congratulations, Eric. He's a he's a new homeowner. Uh, and the first thing you do when you're a new homeowner is now that you have room, you build an infinity table because you have a place to store it. So that's well, the first. Did he get a game mat? Uh, yeah, he did get a game mat. So this is his, his brand new game mat, uh, which I which I delivered. It's uh, the uh, deep cut white sands mat or whatever it's called. Uh, so he's going Fancy. for like the um, uh, low tide. Like all the 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 silt and stuff is exposed at at the beach, right? Kind of thing. Like, yeah, like very cool. flats or like the whatever. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's, it's looking great. I really like the mat a lot actually. And mm -hmm. so we've been trading back and forth some shots of, uh, you know, like old world war two forts off the, off the British Isles sort of stuff. And thinking about building things like that, uh, uh just sort of, uh, getting a feel for, um, stuff that would be on a beach It'd be kind of fun. And then like, you know, uh, you can incorporate areas of, of uh, quicksand or something to make it make it uh, more terrain heavy, things like that. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, a lot of this terrain is donated by uh, folks in our community. Um, so it's a bit eclectic, but I'm sure uh, if, you've, if you've seen his model work, uh, his, his table will soon be soon be at a very high execution level. So that'll be exciting. I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing what he does for terrain. Yeah, it's going to be I've a lot of fun. Seen the one, I've only seen that one box he painted. The the sci-fi cube, right? Yeah, right there. Just the yeah, there it is, right the, there. Yeah, that's that the sci-fi cube. You can see, uh, you can see it on the other side of the bear ups a little better, right? So there you go. It's got some, it's it got some really racing cool. stripes on it, right? To let you know it's sci-fi. It's important. The fast. Cube. It's a fast cube. Yeah, it goes fast. Um, it also flips over. It has a lot of uh, little pegs in it, so that's a good divider for all the terrain. So it's a great storage solution too. I don't know where he got it from, um, but. Uh, but I played Merovingia, and I took a, I took an anaconda. What your anaconda wants some? Yeah. And then it ended. It ended the game uh, pretty much in his deployment zone, which is, I guess, where anaconda should be. Um, so if okay. you, I'm I'm finishing it up right. So you can see I've written the first half, and the rest is still missing text, right? So eventually I'll, I'll finish it up and post it. I've got a couple battle reports in, in line before this. So uh, look for it soon and you'll get to read about what happened um, and you'll find out if, can it be done? Uh, uh. How did you, how did you like the Anaconda? Oh, it was great. It was fantastic. Uh, I used it the same way in our game. So basically, I mean, spoiler alert, right? Uh, it went pretty well for me. 
basically what happened was I won the roll off and chose deployment and he chose to go second. So um, that left me sort of in trouble because you want to hold the panic room at the end of the turn. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I ended up doing was I rolled the Anaconda all the way up, shot a TR bot on the way, um, and then like threw it into suppression, as you can tell by the picture, uh, backed up by a, a Chasseur and a sh uh, and a Chasseur's mine, also in suppression. Um, and uh, it took him a couple orders, right? He managed to do it. He had a Mukhtar Red Fury and smoke sources, so he managed to clear out the Chasseur without too much difficulty. Uh, but he had to sacrifice a Fide to tie up the uh, tie up the Anaconda um, to get into the to get Algebel into the the uh, objective room. Uh, then I rolled up. Um, Mozart and stomp the fide, uh, and then Lugerud stuff to death. So, oh, is he in? He's in Merovingia. Yeah, I think I he's a uh, list. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the list. Well, I mean, we can talk about it really quick. Um, I got a five man group up front uh, Bruant, Lieutenant, Mobilo Sapper, HMG, Aguasil Hacker, because that's in there. I don't know. Uh, then two Metros, because <laughs> They're cheap. Anaconda, right? The second group is two Luguru. Uh, I took I took two grenade launchers in this list, figuring that might be useful in objective room play, right? So I took the viral rifle, boarding shotgun, and then of course Mozart, two chasseurs, because duh, and then um, Mozart, uh, sorry, uh, a dozer and a one trail motorized for smoke. Um, I will definitely switch this list up if I play it again. Uh, I really liked it though. A few things that I didn't know, which I talk about a little bit in the battle report, but those of you listening, two rules, things that tripped me up that you should probably know if you face Merovingia. One, Bruant has a uh, one-use camo state. He cannot be in camo and in a link team at the same time. So yeah. you either have to put him in the link out of camo or use the camo and then reform the link with him in it with a command token or something like that. And apparently, according to Clint, so direct all hate mail towards Clint, um, if, if you start the, on the table out of camo at deployment because it's one use camo. You can go back into camo once, apparently. We can't find any any counter example or anything like that. So that's presumably how it works. That's interesting. So yeah. like the old limited camo is is now you just brought one VLA suit that you shed off and it evaporates. Right, yeah. So that's kind of cool, I guess. So it is. I th that's actually an interesting use case for Panic Room. You roll them up to the Panic Room, Somebody inevitably dies, so the link is degraded. And you're like, I don't need the full link anymore. Pop him out by throwing him into uh, into uh, camo state and then roll him into the room. And now you've got you've got some points in there. So that's something to think about. The other thing is that going into sapper state is a full long skill. So, uh, 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 you know, I thought it was a short skill. So sorry, Eric. Um, I don't really play with sappers that often, but apparently it's a, it's a full order. Um, so be aware of that. It makes the sapper... Sapper State kind of expensive. I thought it was a little more efficient, but uh, I did use it a lot uh, and I like it, but definitely not as efficient as I thought it would be order wise. But yeah, so that'll oh. come soon. You can check it out on mercurycon.net uh, for more details. Well, very cool. That means it is time for our Mythic Games sponsorship. Woo! Yay! All right, so here come the sweet prizes every week. Uh, Mythic Games provides one of our lucky listeners with $10 gift certificate to moe-games.com. Um, John, I picked it last week. Why don't you pick it this week? Uh, Bruant will be the... <laughs> Bruant. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> there we go. So go ahead and spell Bruant. Yep, there we go. Sprinkle Cone is the first one to spell it correctly, I believe. So we'll give people a couple more seconds to lay that out like i'm opening up army right now to double check the spelling and that is correct b-r-u-a-n-t <laughs> <laughs> excellent excellent oh <laughs> seems fine French -ass name. Um, all right <laughs> all right so go ahead and <laughs> push that oh no you're right sorry clint you did it first but you are also right you don't count it's true all right here we go rolling it Hit that button. Hey! Oh, there we go. Sprinkle cone. The Congratulations, first Aaron. correctly. <laughs> Congratulations. I will go ahead and get your info over to Ruben. And um, that's Aaron. Yep. Yep. Cool. So I'll even just message them on Discord. Cool. So I'll go ahead and get their information over to Ruben. Thank you all for listening. And thank you, Ruben, of course, for sponsoring us with Mythic Games. Um, you mm -hmm. can still go there, I think, and still order the uh, the bundle for Crimson Stone yep. at a sweet discount. And anything else you might be missing. 
add anything else. I don't know if he has dystopian wars, and and I think he's looking into getting heavier. So we'll slowly get him to to carry all of our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, exactly. That's 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 the way to do it. Oh, excellent. Well, without further delay, it's time for the main event. Dystopian Wars. Dystopian Wars. That's why we're here tonight. So John and I played a game, three games of Dystopian Wars, and um, it was fun. So like full disclosure, they sent us the game for free. Yes. Right? They're like, here you go. Please help us out and, you know, play this game. Tell people what you think about it. Um. They did not pay us a penny beyond that, so so um, they are getting a. You know, I think this is pretty safe to say an honest review of a game that honestly I might not have tried otherwise. Yeah, I mean they gave so, us a review copy. That's basically. I mean I would have made you play it. I've got two fleets, so eventually right. at some would, point down the yeah. road. Um. So I'm pretty glad that uh, that they did because it was it was fun. Absolutely, it was enjoyable. So, John, why don't you uh, give us a little, little intro of what it is? Sure. So, Dystopian Wars uh, is a uh, used to be a Spartan Games property, right? So, it's kind of like Weird War One is the best way I can describe it. If you've never heard okay. of it before, um, it's got boats, planes, trains, not no, <laughs> boats, boats, planes. It's got ridiculous tanks, robots, uh, giant land ships, um, dirigibles, gyrocopters, like all the fun Weird War steampunk stuff you can come up with is there. Um, uh, when Spartan went under, War Cradle bought them, uh, and then they also have the Wild West Exodus property. Uh, so they've now merged the canon of both games, and so they exist in the same universe. Uh, and basically, it's set in the late 1800s. Um, there's like a, something called Element 270, which is like the universe is unobtainium, like magic nonsense. Uh, and it's like does, like gives unlimited energy. Uh, it's like uh, powers all the weapons. It's basically um, the, the Tesseract from the first Captain America movie, right? It like shoots lasers and stuff. Um, and so of course everybody wants it and all the, all, there's like huge, uh, huge fights over it. And then the, um, a bunch of scientists go to Antarctica where all the stuff was discovered and they like form their own, their own community and try to research it. And, and everybody wants their stuff. So they have to like fight off all the, all the, all the other world powers. So the other thing is all, all the world powers are more or less represented as well. Um, you've got, uh, let me see if I can pull it up, but, uh, but it's all a little different. Yeah. It's, it's all a little the... different. And, and they've combined them because in the old version, uh, back in Spartan games, they had like, all the countries that it was like Italy and France and Germany were all distinct countries. Uh, but now they've like combined Italy and France into like one thing, um, just to, just to reduce skew count, which I think is a, it's a, it's a good idea in general. Right. So here's, here's the, here's the factions as, as they stand today. Right. So union is, uh, the, the U S effectively the union won the civil war. Um, you've got the enlightened, which are the Antarcticans. Um, Commonwealth is like uh, Russia. What, what I will say is, thankfully, yeah. I, I did read the fluff on the Union because uh, I was a little worried about it. Sure. And I will sure. say it was the South won the war, but they ended up with more of the sensibilities of the North. And I think I think um, the, the well, I mean, at some point they do win, I think. Yeah. We, we, yeah you, can, you can go check for if you if you're super curious. Um, but it's it's it's. They've handled they some avoid, of the They avoid issues. the problematic. They seem to avoid the problematic parts of the right. South winning the Civil War. Right. Uh, That's all the important part that I said. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, then they have the, uh, the 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 Enlightened, right, which is the the Covenant of Antarctica. If you're used to the old the old stuff, Commonwealth is Russia, all of the Baltic states. Um, the Imperium is basically like Germany and all of its satellites. Alliance is all the Romance countries, right? So France, Italy. Um, Crown is Britain. Uh, and all of its territories. Empire is just like Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, and then the Sultanate, which is uh, the Middle East. Um, so a lot of these are less developed than uh, than others, right? So uh, there's still mm -hmm. a lot of stuff is still coming out month to month. We we just saw in our our releases, uh, our sorry, our news section earlier that we we got three releases this month. Uh, so they're definitely. Uh, updating stuff quickly, right? So when we were preparing for the show, even uh, we were looking at um, we we're looking at all the documentation for the various factions. There was new art 
in in the PDF that we were downloading. So they're definitely putting out new content continuously. So don't don't feel bad or concerned if you're like I really want to play you know uh, the Sultanate and I don't see any stuff or whatever. Uh, it, it'll come. So uh, yeah, it is it is really interesting because um, I was familiar with the old miniatures. I never bought into it, but I was like, oh, these models look these models look neat. Um, the new edition of the game is a total redo of everything. Yeah. So the rules seem, from what I understand, the rules are rewritten from the ground up. Um, the models are all getting re-sculpted in plastic for the most part for the yep. core parts of the fleets with resin battleships. Um, it is a total revamp of everything. And so they've also done a lot of, con- like you, you kind of alluded to it, consolidating of the different nations. Yes. So you won't play you won't play a French list, or I mean, you probably could play your own themed list, but the the French army is part of Alliance. Right. So one thing that's of note for those of you who used to have Dystopian Wars minis and you know stopped playing when Spartan went under, uh, I am on that boat with you. No pun intended. Uh, I have I have a Prussian fr- fleet and a French fleet from back then. Uh, I never got to play just because I ended up moving right around the time we would have started playing, um, but. If you're concerned, you can go to their army list, and at the very end, there is a uh, equivalency table, right? So if you have one of the ships on the left, it counts as one of the ships on the right, and then um, it'll it'll maybe like you can't build a particular variant of an old ship, because that variant doesn't exist in the new rules. But there's like a way for you to use your old minis, and if you look online. There's tons of examples of like this is an old uh, uh, you know a Prussian ship versus a new Prussian ship. They look similar enough. The design language is similar. Uh, if you paint everything uh, with the with the with the same scheme, uh, it'll just look like different generations of ships, like we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah, if, exactly right. So if you if you have uh, a Grizzly Troll is asking if you if you have an old set of Antarctica or Persia, you can play them. Uh, you may not be able to use all of your stuff. Right, so some of the some of the old things like the old Metzger robot for Prussia, like the big like Prussian helmet giant robot that like grabs things with a giant Tesla claw and sucks the ships under, uh, that doesn't exist yet. I couldn't find the rules for it, but I you know they have art for it, so I imagine it'll it'll yeah, make the I, I suspect because like so it looks like they initially released all of the old ships are playable at least. Yeah, yeah. And then I think as they as they expand, um, it, they don't have any of the the walkers in the game yet the, of the new sculpts. So I think as they do, you'll be able to use your old walkers, the new walker. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And but the walkers are it, super sweet looking. I mean, like, look at this thing, right? So just knowing what I know about Russian ships, the head <laughs> is an iceberg cannon. So it just like shoots icebergs at you. <laughs> so that's we cool. Trade? I clearly picked the wrong fleet. I, you have the whale pedos back. I, I mean, like, it's got, so... it's got an iceberg Face, it shoots icebergs out of its face and it's got a giant drill arm that like after it like traps you in an iceberg it can like drill your face i don't know it sounds awesome i i yeah, can't wait yeah. to to do that thing to you um yeah also like just the like all the all the rivets and and like gears and things you can see just like falling out of this are fantastic i love it great great like i will say i was design. a little worried about the when, when they kind of merged the Wild West Exodus universe with the dystopian universe, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, the dystopian universe would get a little too wacky. And then it I was saw already Iceberg super game. wacky. It, it was. It was like it was somewhere between like really wacky lore. And then they tried to make as believable of a ship as possible. So it did, there was always that little bit of a disconnect for me. But now I feel like they've kind of leaned into it and it works. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like it's it's hard to uh, let's see. Ooh, that's interesting, but yeah, mm-hmm. right. So like, this is the the Japanese Kraken. Uh, it's a Kraken yeah. robot, and it's on, and some of the tentacles has got guns, so it can like pop the tentacles out and shoot you a bunch, and then like grab your ship and tear it to pieces. So what? Those, those are things you can do. Uh, yeah, the land wars are are basically uh, like there, there's also um, it's it's intended to be land and sea and air. Uh, so there are enormous land ships. Right, so uh, let me see if I can find a picture. But there's like a Prussian land carrier. Uh, but the the idea is that you you have you have access to basically uh, all of your heart's desires about like giant steampunk vehicles, right? So here is a here's the Prussian land carrier, 
or land ship. It's it's an airfield <laughs> I... on treads or wheels or whatever, and it's shaped like a giant iron cross. I mean, this is actually pretty clever if you think about it, right? You can land, you can launch ships off of one one arm of the cross, and you can land uh, planes, you know, ships on the other. I think I think that's pretty pretty clever, and just like engineering wise. Um, I, this would never work engineering wise, but in in a land of unobtainium and repulsor lifts and you know anti gravity generators, this is totally fine. Um, but yeah, there's like all kinds of like silly land ships and like this hilarious Prussian dirigible, also a airfield in the sky, right? So if you if you like uh, was it Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, this is like straight that kind of feel, um, all kinds of hilarious things, and it's very very uh, fun and exciting to to get yourself involved in the the yeah i'm really i'm really curious to see how they expand the game because because they are basically starting from scratch yeah i'm sure it'll be a couple of years before we get to the land battles mm -hmm. but they are at least uh seeming like they're they're putting the airships in the game pretty early yeah yeah they started off with the war rotors and then they've shown a lot of artwork for some of the flying carriers already so we can we can hope that all that will come back for all sure right. So that's a bit about the setting and the history and where the game came from. Uh, let's talk about how the game is played a bit. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a miniature war game. Uh, you have models, which you pay points to get in your list. And then there yeah. are objective points or victory points or whatever you the game manual ends up calling them. Uh, so how do you win dystopian wars? Basically, you collect more victory points than your opponent at the end of the hey. at the end of the start of the game, right? <laughs> That's it. So the way you do that is there are scenarios just like all the other games we play, uh, which have scenario specific mm -hmm. rules, and you get VP for those. Uh, there's also um, uh, kind of like the lieutenant. Some generic. Yeah, some generic rules. Yeah, so the, the, the generic stuff is like it, there's a flagship, right? Because it's a, it's a boat game. There's a flagship or a ship game, I should mm -hmm. say, before I get in trouble. Um, yeah, come on. All right, all right. I apologize. Okay, so if your flagship survives the game, you get one point. If you cripple your opponent's flagship, you get one point. Uh, and okay. uh, if you have a multi-model unit and you kill the whole group, right, all of them are gone, you get a point as well. Uh, that doesn't count okay. if it's a single model that you've killed. So you can't so just a single like, cruiser isn't worth a point. Right, but, but if you have two cruisers in a group. Or, or, yeah, a, a unit of cruisers right. than it is. Um, and then they did this really cool thing, which I like a lot which is that they've got uh, these these cards, right? So there's a victor and va uh, uh, valor and victory cards, right? So they're, they're two-sided. Uh, one says valor, one says victory. Uh, basically, um, the valor side is some buff that you get, right? So this one says, reveal this card, discard it any time to gain the following. Reroll any dice in one of your action dice pools. So this basically, like, if you hate what you rolled, you throw this down, you're like, I don't like it, I'm rerolling everything. But if you do that, you don't get to do what it says on the victory side. And this one says, uh, if you destroyed a mass two unit in a shooting attack this turn, you score one VP, right? So you're- This is, I really like this mechanic. Yeah, it's really cool. Right, so you've got your your hand basically of, of special effects to help you do better during the turn. Right. But as you do those, you're eating into your potential victory points you could score. Yeah, it's actually more complicated than that because if you look in the corner, uh, there's a little gear icon. Let's see if I can get it up to the camera. There you go. Right. So there this is this is this is number thirty-one, and this one is number twenty-five. And there are sixty cards in the deck, numbered one through sixty. Uh, and basically, you use the value on the card to bid for initiative the next turn. And usually, the highest value cards are like stupid good. So uh, the, I think the, the I think the, they they have a lot of repeats on the Victor Valerie condition Victor victory valor conditions uh, and the highest valued ones are like uh you basically get to do two activations in a row so it's an i go you go activation system so that's pretty strong it's effectively getting like a second mini turn but then you might not get initiative the next turn right so that's the kind of the yep. the, the balancing mechanic they've done there so this is really elegant um gives you something to be uh holding in your hand right there's it kind of feels like you have a uh, combat tricks and magic Right, you're like, ah, I'm just gonna do this thing sure. now, um, and and you get some benefit, but you but you have you pay a resource, which is points, and sometimes like you can't do the thing, right? The opponent may not have yeah. the thing for you to kill on their side of the table. You're like, oh, this is totally just a buff for me now, um, and that's that's fine. Buff or an initiative card. Yeah, or an initiative card, right? So all kinds of things, and then uh, the number of cards you get scales with the point size of the game, as does the table, right? Uh, so there's that too, um, but yeah. So in terms of how you play the game. 
right? So effectively, uh, yeah, I, they, they saved me a lot of work. Uh, they've got a how to play on their <laughs> website. Basically, you choose the mission. The, um, you, 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 know, you agree on what your point graphic, size is. Actually. Yeah, helpful graphics too, right? And then, and then you deploy, right? Deployment is alternating again. Um, you determine initiative using your, your cards. Um, and then, you know, you fill your hand back up. Uh, there's some there's some there's some mechanics that you can use to like steal initiative. We won't get into that. You can read the rules if you're interested. It basically uses like bid cards effectively. Then there's an activations phase. Effectively, you alternate activating units, which are uh, you yep. know, combat groups. Right? Effectively, you use like this blob of guys does does the thing, and you resolve all of the like the entire thing for that unit. Um, so that's operations, which is usually like uh, special movement rules you can do. Like I'm gonna do uh, a full reverse, right? So you can go backwards, uh, uh -huh. and that uh -huh. and that does things to you. You can like launch um, uh, air assets or underwater assets, like whales, for example. That's when you launch your whale pedos, uh, and then you you move your guy, you shoot some stuff, and then there's even an assault phase for all of you 40k players out there, where uh, oh, man. either either you're a giant robot and the assault phase. Is, is is modeling like your giant robot taking its fist and like smashing something with it or you're a ship and you're you have dudes with like element 270 jetpacks that like jetpack over there and then shoot like lightning guns into the enemy crew um, I, I love this rare this very important rare element is basically everywhere mm -hmm. exactly um but yeah. so the activation thing is important because that has you know you then are Dealing with juggling initiative, kind of like a you know alternating, basically alternating activation in any game. You know, we run into it with Warcry all the time. We right. do it all the time in Heavy Gear, where you know it's it, you know, there's a lot of strategy strategy that goes into how many units do you take to to out to out activate your opponent or not. Mm -hmm. But the the assault phase was was particularly interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it, we're gonna. It can be pretty bloody if you're not if you're not careful. Um... We'll, we'll dig into that a little bit deeper when we get down to the individual game mechanics. So when you're building your fleet, right? So there's points limits, which is pretty standard, I think, in every game we play. Yep. Um, but when you make your list, you've got different battle fleets. And I couldn't figure this out. Are, do you have one battle fleet? Is a battle fleet like a sub list or is a battle fleet like a detachment? A battle fleet is like a detachment, right? So effectively okay. it's a it's a it's another layer of hierarchy. You have your your force, which is what we would call a list, right? And then you can think of a battle fleet like an infinity combat group, and then a unit is like okay. a fire team, if that makes any sense. Sure, sure, sure. Right? That makes so, sense. So, so you could have multiple battle fleets in yeah, an army. Right. And so okay. you look at this and you say, this is, uh, this is your faction, the, uh, the, the Covenant of the Enlightened or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you can have this Enlightened battle fleet and it says what you need to have it, right? So you got to have a flagship unit with the Enlightened trait. And that basically is just the requirement. Then you, can, you, yep. you may include more stuff. And then, um, and then it has some other things. And then if you build one of these, you get a, like in this case, you get a reroll. Right, it says you get a command reroll. Other ones, um, you know, there's Archimedes uh, battle fleet. So this is even more restrictive. Your flagship is not just from your faction; it also must be this particular class, right? And then so there's more, uh, more restrictions here. But because there's more restrictions on this, you get uh, an additional reroll or something. And then like other things, like it's not just rerolls. You get this um, uh, some some extra. Uh, SRS tokens, which are short range squadrons, that's what they call it. That's short range squadrons represent, you know, planes, um, you know, like little attack submarines, like escort boats, that kind of thing, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, so they're kind of they're kind of the ordnance from yeah. playing Battlefleet Gothic yeah. if you played that back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking that probably another good uh way to describe the battle fleets if people here play um Age of Sigmar, they're like a war scroll battalion. Oh sure. You can, they give you a certain bonus to these units in that group. Right. Right. Or I I forgot what they call them in 40k, but I think they got rid of them. Um, um, but yeah. Oh, this is the, yeah, this is, I just noticed you have the updated list. I haven't had a chance to look at this one yet. Yeah. I mean, everything is new. So we, as we were, we were like, we were surprised this morning when I was uh, going through all this stuff and I was like, wait, did they change all this since I looked at it last? Cause we were preparing for the show. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it is what you expect, right? So here here is a unit profile. Let's just take a look at it real quick. So it costs 420 points. These are its stats over here. And it's got like a bunch of traits and special rules. And then um, it comes with a particular set of weapons. You can see all these weapons here. Uh, and then you may upgrade, right? This is like a war gear option yeah. table. You can say, I'm going to replace 
uh, it says here, I may replace any particle beam or weapon with one of these things. And then uh, if you replace it with a pulse emitter, it's free. Or if you replace it with a molecular disharmonizer, it costs 12 <laughs> points, right? And then you can go up here and see what a molecular deharmonizer does. Um, and it's apparently real freaking good at supporting, but very bad at doing anything else, which is interesting. Oh, that's weird. Right. There's so many cool mechanics in, in yeah. this fleet. So they've, they've, one of the neat things is that they've done a lot of, uh, they have, they have a few weapon traits. It's not like a giant mess of things, kind of like heavy gear. There's a, just a few things, um, in terms of like, they call them quality. We would call them traits and heavy gear or something like that, or like yeah. rules or something, uh, like, uh, like mimetism or something in infinity. Um, but, uh, just by doing this and then changing the range increments uh the dice you get at different range increments really creates a different feel for each kind of type of weapon um so yeah, yeah that's that's sort of how uh you you build uh a fleet right you 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 pick a battle group um uh, sorry a battle fleet and then you you assemble as many as you can fit and you you obey all the rules and then some things like for example let's like pick a random thing down here um Let's get, yeah, so for example, uh, so this is an Antarctica Superiority Cruiser, which costs 155 points. Uh, you may, you may include, so if you buy this thing, it's a, it's a unit of one Antarctica Superiority Cruiser. If you want a unit right. of more than one, it says in the bottom left here, it says squadron. This unit may include up to two additional models at, you know, 155 points per model. So you just buy more things for your unit and you just put them in there. That's it. Um, so it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, all kinds of other stuff happens. So uh, one thing we didn't talk about is that you can replace guns with different guns, right? That's yeah useful and good. You can also replace guns with what are called generators, which basically are like different kinds of buffs. So there's like a magnetic generator, which like creates a magnetic field that repels projectiles, right? So you can give yourself a little bit of shielding that way. There's uh, atomic generators and fury generators, which sound like, you know, what they might do. Uh, Fury makes you stronger in close combat. Atomic generator gives you more energy to, like, go faster, things like that. Um, shield generator does exactly what it sounds like. All kinds of stuff. So, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of customization for it. You know, it's more like 40K in that regard, where your individual ships have a lot of options yep. uh, in some cases. Yep. And, you know, those options can totally dictate the way you you play with the ship. You know, the difference between the, the pulse emitter and the, the other... The, the the longer ranged gun, uh, particle <laughs> right. beamer and pulse emitter. There we go. Or I'm still learning the names, so I apologize for uh, dystopian wars. Like the difference between does this model want to operate at 20 inches or 10 inches? Right. Um, that's actually so one of the things I I wanted to mention when you were showing the the ranges there, the yeah. three different columns. All guns operate with the same three range bands. It's basically short, medium, long range. Uh, and it's just 10, 20, 30 inches. So they've done some things that are um, really just easy to learn. You don't need to look things up. But uh, I, I actually want to save that for the the thoughts at the very end, because there's so many interesting elements that I want to make sure we talk about the, the mechanics more before we dig into that. Yeah, so, so, so maybe we should take a look at a unit card next. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Let's pull up an individual unit, talk about what we're seeing. Right, so so unfortunately, uh, they had unit cards available like a couple days ago, Yesterday. but they're they're gone now, and I didn't save one, so that's on me. Uh, so <laughs> this is the this is the slightly low res version that's in the in the main in the main um, uh, rule book, which is available for free online. I'm sure the unit cards will come back. I'm sure they're just updating them. Um, but basically, yeah. this is the thing, right? So let's go through it really quick. Um, the easiest thing to understand is speed, right? Uh, speed eight means you move eight inches. That's it's the thing, crazy. right? Hull is also easy to understand. That's your HP. Uh, once you run out of hull, you flip over to your crippled state, and that has a, a different hull value, per perhaps. And if you run out of that hull, then you're just dead. So yeah. that's how that works. Uh, you 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 generally get worse as you get crippled. Some ships they're they're they get angrier, so their close combat increases, which is funny. Okay, so then there's mass. Mass represents the the size of your I ship. The ship is. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, mass one ships, for example, don't have a crippled side. If you do something that would cripple them, they're just dead. Um, yep. Uh, also, uh, mass represents your inertia. So um, you basically get a free movement uh, of of your mass. It's called drift. So when you move, you drift forward your mass value. So if you're a mass one thing, you move one inch forward, and then you complete your move. 
Uh, so that's what mass means. Uh, we'll talk about Citadel and Armor in a second. Uh, turn limit is uh, basically what it sounds like. So there's a little turn widget, which I don't have in front of me. Maybe you have one you can pull it up. Uh, I think you, they, they, only, they only give you one yep. in, the, in the starter set. So Adam has it. It's at his, at his place. Um, it's, it's basically a three-inch radius turn, five-inch outside diameter. Right. So effectively, if you want to turn, you basically move one, one increment on the turn widget. And if your turn limit is five, you can only do that five times. That's it. Right? Yeah. So bigger ships have a lower turn limit to represent how chonky they are, and you can turn, I think, at any point during your movement. Um, so that seems fine. Um, then you have your um, defense right up here, and you'll know that this is split, and there's a little like sort of wave iconography there. Uh, so the defense above, the number above the wave is your aerial defense. So if you get shot at with... Um, you know, rockets that are coming down from the air. You have your anti-air guns, and you can shoot back and maybe destroy some of the rockets to hit your ship. And the one below the waves is your anti-submerged defense, and that basically does the same thing for torpedoes. It's a countermeasures. You may remember it being called in Dystopian Wars uh, for the old original. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so now let's talk about armor and citadel. So okay. to do that, we probably want to talk about the dice a little bit. So um, effectively, the dice have uh, let me let me pull up my. I love these dice. Yeah, so the dice are fun. Uh, they're six-sided dice, right? Not not too not too uh, surprising there. Let me see if I can pull up all the faces, and then I need um, explodey explodey version, right? So I'll pull up a higher res version of this in a second. But basically, those are your six faces, and uh, effectively, the the red sides are going to be your successes for shooting, and your blue sides is going to be your successes for defending, right? That's 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 it. So here here is here is the list of things. Um, yep. The iconography is, 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 is pretty clear. Blank does nothing generally. Um, counter is one defense. Heavy counter is two defense. Hit is one defense. Heavy hit is two defense, right? There's two explodey things. Exploding hits count as two. And in most cases, they'll allow you to roll an additional die, right? So the old Dystopian Wars had an exploding sixes mechanic. So every time you roll one of those exploding hits, you get to roll another die, add it to the pool, uh, which is pretty great. Um, and those count as two, just to reiterate. So um, basically... So when you're, when yeah. you're attacking, mm -hmm. you're looking for the hits. When, yeah, when you're and defending... When you're, when you're, you're defending, looking, you're looking for the shields. Precisely. Um, and so if I was attacking you with uh, something that could be defended against, not everything can. So if I'm shooting you with rockets, let's say I roll like say 10 dice and I get some hits and then you have, this, I'm shooting at this HMS Unremarkable as it's called. I love that name. Yeah, right, it's pretty great. <laughs> and then so you would roll four dice because your aerial defense is four, right? That's the above the waves um, number. And then you basically would subtract the number of shields from my number of hits and that's what comes that's left over to do damage to you. Right, that's basically the way it works. So exactly. how do you do damage? Basically, every multiple of the target's armor, you do one point. So if you do four points, if I roll four successes, right, that doesn't meet the armor value of the HMS Unremarkable, and I do nothing. Which is five. Yeah. So you do nothing. I do nothing. If I roll five, I do one damage. If I do six, I do one damage. If I roll seven, I do one damage, right? It's not until I get to 10 that I do two damage. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every multiple of five... Um, you you end up uh, you end up getting uh, one one addition. Oh, sorry, every multiple of the armor. Now, what does Citadel do? So Citadel, for those of you who aren't like naval nerds, right? Citadel is like the big armored area inside the ship with all the important bits, like the engine and stuff, and like the powder right? reserves and whatnot. So if you exceed the Citadel rating in number of hits, something bad happens, and you roll a critical hit die, uh, which have which they've given us in the starter set, and they have these adorable <laughs> little icons. Um, and basically, they're all, awful. they're all awful, right? So something bad happens to you. So in addition to taking the damage you would take calculated by armor, you also may get totally effed by uh, the critical damage die. So uh, these are the options there. Shredded defenses is your defenses are zero. That's super bad. Um, yep. Strigenium flare. Strigenium is the name for element 270. Strigenium flare means like some crazy steampunk so here, shenanigan the happens. goes haywire for yeah. a second and like launches your ship forward. Right. So you crash into other ships, move out of formation. As far as I understand it, like you create like a localized like space time distortion. And so any squadrons around you just go poof because they're like lost in the Bermuda Triangle and your ship just like teleports three inches forward and may crash into stuff. Um, navigation lock, your turn, your turn, uh, um, 
Current count is reduced to zero. You got to go in a straight line. Reactor leak is what it sounds like. It's bad. Magazine explosion causes damage. Also bad. Generator shutdown turns off your generators if you have a buff generator going on. Um, so those are funny, especially because there are things that let ships fly, right? They're skimming. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I think if they lose the generator, they crash on land, bad things happen. So one oh, interesting thing that happens is um, once you roll one of these things, so let's say like, let's say I caused, I, I managed to sit at LU and I rolled, uh, I rolled a, um, a Sturginium flare. So I leave that by your ship. So that is now a critical damage token and not a die. And let's say yeah. the next turn or the next round of shooting, I also roll really well and I Citadel you again. And then I happen to roll the same icon. So because you already have this Serginium Flare token, uh, I cannot apply it again. So then you just take damage, right? And that's bad. Uh, so you, you, yeah. you generally don't want to leave these on your ship if you can avoid it. And there's a thing at the end of the... Um, uh, a mechanic at the end of the end phase where you can uh, roll to see if you clear some stuff. It is a very deadly. Game oh my of god! Work. It is so lethal. If you thought Infinity was lethal, <laughs> like this game, it this is, game is like super lethal. It's ridiculous. It is a very deadly game of both. Yeah, yeah, for but, sure. So right there, those the dice are really neat, right? Because there's no like skill of three up to hit, five up to wound, then you roll your armor state, right? But right. all of the math, it's kind of one step for the math. You roll the dice, and you, as Clint pointed out, you floor function it right. against their armor, and you know how much damage you've inflicted. Right. Right. And it's it's generally easy to work numbers, because even when you're rolling, like, you've got 27 hits, and it's like, okay, you've got eight armor, and that's really easy math. Right? I'm going to do my three points of damage, and we're going to carry on, and I'm also going to sit a value. Um you don't use dice with numbers on them, I think, ever in the game. You don't, you're just as far using, as I can tell, yeah. Yeah, you're just using these and those special critical dice. And they give you a uh, pile of them. You're not going to run out. It'll be fine. Yeah, the, no, the two-player starter set comes with enough dice for two players. Yeah, Which I sure. thought was super cool. Yeah. Um, it also comes with two of the decks of cards. The only thing yeah. that doesn't come with two sets of templates, I'm, which I'm kind of like, come on, guys, you did everything else. Right, yeah. Uh, you can buy the templates, though. I think you can buy a template pack. One thing we didn't talk about is the fray value, right, and how assaults work. So yeah, let's, talk let's, about talk about, really let's talk about how fighting happens. Yeah, so fighting is basically like you calculate your fray plus the opponent's citadel and their defense, right? So yeah. um, let's take a look at a unit card really quick. Um, of course, I just made things annoying for myself by scrolling past. Anyway, so uh, going back to our original thing, so the, the HMS... The unremarkable. Unremarkable has a fray of eight, right? I just happen to remember that. And it has a citadel of eight and a defense of four. So effectively, what's going on here is um, the attacking player gets their fray pool of eight, and then the defending player gets their citadel value in dice plus the defense of the relevant type. So if you're getting attacked from... Submarine land, you'd use your you know underwater defense. If you're getting attacked on the surface, which represents people like doing a boarding action, you can use your aerial defense because you can like imagine turning the anti-aircraft guns like down, uh, to, you know like uh, depressing <laughs> them and just like you know dacking everybody coming across the the gangplank Clearing or whatever. The decks. Um, yeah, exactly. And then and then you just roll like a normal defense roll and attack roll. So you roll. You roll for hits on the attacking side, and you roll for shields on the defending side, uh, but it's not a straight one-to-one -one anymore because it doesn't go against your armor value. Because the armor doesn't matter in um, in in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? Like there's people inside the ship blowing stuff up. You know, like this looks this looks important, and then like planting C4 on it or whatever, uh, or I guess right. a Serginium bomb or something, right? Um, and so you consult this table, and basically. Uh, you know, if it's a draw or not a very overwhelming success, nothing really happens. If the defender rolls a ton of uh, shields and the attacker rolls in buff kiss, right, then you could counter assault and do some points of damage to the attacker, which is funny, but probably rarely happens. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, getting the chance to get a disorder condition or a critical damage roll. Disorder conditions basically just sort of nerf you and, and, uh, uh, and, and make it harder for you to interact and, and buff or be buffed by other elements of your your, your mm -hmm. list. Uh, and then if you roll real well, you just do straight damage and murder stuff. So there's that. Right, so something, uh, we pulled up this chart for Frey. Um, one of the things I really appreciate about this edition of Dystopian Wars compared to things like Battlefleet Gothic or Drop Fleet is there's not a lot of charts to look up. Right. You know, it's it's very rare that you've got a chart to look up 
to see the results of everything it feels like in some other games where this i think that was the only chart that we really interacted with regularly i mean i think we've shown you all the charts already just in the course of this like thing you learned the charts yeah the charts are done um all right so let's let's uh let's kind of break down um going back to the the game mechanics so start of your turn we have the initiative yep right the initiative is going to be determined basically we are drawing our hand of cards and then bidding one of the cards against the opponent in an attempt to get initiative. So this means that when you have a card that's really good as a, you know, it's Valor, right? Or Victory. So like this has a cool buff. This has an easy to score objective point. Or it's a really high number that could score me initiative during the turn. That, you know, that's the decision you have to make when you're looking at your hand, which is a really fun yeah. um, poker game. Right, it's like a it's a one player poker game basically because you're playing it against what your opponent also then might play, so that's a cool spot right there. Uh, and then once you have a so let's say you have initiative, you pick one of your units to activate. Obviously, movement happens first. Yeah, uh, just like ninety nine percent of the games I think that are out there. Um, well, well, uh, sorry, operations happens first. So operations, oh yeah, there's operations. a lot of stuff that happens in there. So operations, then movement, right? It's so like operations, the commands. Yes, this, yes, things like uh, sometimes you want to go backwards or stop moving because you might crash into something. So you can do operations yeah. then. It's the orders, can, basically. Yeah, yeah, you can launch your fighters or something or your whale pedos. Uh, and the last thing you can do, which is important, is usually that's when stuff and scenarios happen. So like if you need to yeah. make a whip roll, you would do it then. Right, so if like, you need to scan a quadrant or grab an objective, like it happens, you spend you spend like a, the order in your operations phase or whatever, and then you can't do anything else. So you can't like launch fighters if you're doing the objective. Um, right. And it also is important because sometimes it's like you have to be in a certain place before you can do the whip roll or like do the objective, which means on the previous turn you've had to have gotten there. So on your next activation before you move, you can do the thing, right? So yeah. I, I remember that coming up in our game, and I was like, "Oh, this is interesting." Yeah. I made a mistake. I should have done a thing and move and just like top speed it out of here or whatever. Right, and it's 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 kind of the inverse of infinity. You can't move up and then score the objective because right. you're scoring the objective in the operation. Right. So you need to plan a turn in advance, um, which is appropriate for naval games. What am I doing next turn? Where's my ship pointed? So, yep. all right. So you do your initiative. You pick your unit. You activate them. You perform your special operations. Then you're going to move with them. So movement, you start off by drifting the model. And that is basically they move straight forward their mass in inches. So mass one model drifts forward one inch, mass three model drifts forward three inches. So bigger ships tend to be slower but have more mass and then drift more. So they have more movement that is out of your direct control. And then you can spend your movement value to move any number of inches or turn any number of inches up to your turn limit right. around the table. So uh, here, here's a picture of turning, right? So you just there you go. align the turning template, which is a plastic widget you get in the box, and then you just like align the butt of your ship, or I guess the stern of your ship, to uh, the notch, and then yeah. you just rotate it around. So every this this counts as movement, right? So if your movement is eight, your speed is eight. Every time you move along this thing until you run out of turns, you're also costing your movement, right? So you can't just do you know go super fast and also turn and go really far as a result of that. Right. Yeah, it's a pretty easy it's a pretty easy uh, turning system, I think. So. Yep. So your ships are going to drift. You can turn. It's pretty straightforward other than that. You want to make sure that you keep your you know, keep your facings the way you want them to try to catch the enemy you know, in the, the proper arcs of your guns. Mm -hmm. So then we get to shooting and the attack rolls in this game are super straightforward. Right. It just took a minute to figure out the chart. Do you want to pull back up the the uh, enlightened robot? Yeah, I'm doing it right it? now. Cool. Basically, the way it works is you're going to check the range to your target, and you can pre-measure any time in this game. Yep. You check the range to your target, and you roll the appropriate number of dice. So uh, we've got the three columns there. So point blank is 10 inches, closing is 20 inches, long is 30 inches. So like, let's say we are up close and personal with a uh, frigate with a pulse emitter. They're going to roll eight dice at point blank range. Right. So the, now, the, the green number... line is not crippled or battle ready, as it's called in the game, yeah. and red is crippled. Now, when you have a unit firing multiples of the same gun, or it's really guns with identical traits, but right. that doesn't happen very often. It's really easier to say same guns. But I mean, we can see that like there's particle beamers and pulse emitters are both sustained in gunnery. 
When you do that, you, instead of rolling the full number of dice for every attack after the first, you roll the number, you add the number of dice in parentheses. Right. So, for example, if I have two frigates, both with pulse emitters, and I want them both to attack the same target, I have a choice of each one resolves, in, in, sorry, the two of them in point blank range against the same target. Uh, yeah. I can either resolve two separate eight dice attacks, or I can resolve yep. a eight plus six die attack. So for a total of 14, right? Yeah. So you have to make the decision, is my initial dice pool solo per ship good enough to generate enough hits to exceed the opponent's armor multiple times? Or do I want to generate a truly staggering giant dice pool and uh, roll like a fistful of dice um, and and you know get a lot of successes and, and exceed their armor or their citadel even better right so it's yeah. kind of this this decision you make on all t uh, every time you do it the other thing is you don't get to know what happens until you've declared all of your attacks so yeah so you clear you clear yeah. all of your tar attacks and all of your targets yep um, and good morning the mighty job <laughs> he's watching from Scotland or it's five forty five yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you, you resolve all you, you declare all of your attacks for your unit. You, you know, you have to declare not only uh, what guns you're shooting at where, also you have to pay attention to fire arcs. We totally glossed over that. But like you'll see uh, on, on various unit cards, like this can shoot to the port, this can shoot the starboard, four aft, all that stuff. So you can't shoot at stuff you can't see in the arc, makes sense, right? Um, you can't shoot the same gun more than once, also makes sense, uh, with the exception of broadsides because they're port and starboard. So you can shoot to the left and to the right at the same turn, that's fine. Um, yeah. But yeah, so basically you, you, you tally up who's shooting what and whether you're supporting. That's what the mechanic is if you're helping your buddy out. Um, and, and then you resolve all the attacks. Now, if you... Then you roll your, your fat pile of dice. You roll your fat pile of dice and resolve what happens. Now, if you happen to kill something straight up, the follow-on attacks that were targeting the dead model, uh, you may point at something else. Right, so there's a, there's yeah. a couple caveats to that, but you can, you know, so you, they're not wasted. You don't have to be concerned about like super overkilling something, but you may be in a situation where like um, two attacks is super overkill, and you're really looking for like 1.25 worth of attacks. So you you right. kind of want to budget uh, budget where your dice pool goes where. So for example, the um, um, the Prussians, right? Uh, uh, the the Imperium, right? Now they're called. Um, yeah. So the Imperium have this rule which allows them to move exploding dice around. So instead of like adding to my current die pool, I can bank those exploding dice for a different shot elsewhere in my unit, which sort of what? helps that helps that problem. Is that, that like a Tesla sense. coil rule or something? It, yeah, I forget it's it's got some weird thing. I forget the name of it, but yeah, it's got that rule. It's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's the thing that happens. Sturginium sharing beam. No, it's like it starts with an I. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Okay. Um, um, so but, yeah, but but what it, basically what it is that this this attack mechanic is really straightforward. You're just rolling a pool of dice. There are sometimes modifiers to that dice pool. If somebody has a shield generator; it's two less dice. Right. But there seem to be very few of those modifiers, mm -hmm. um, which actually leads to the game being really quick and easy to learn. Uh, at least for, for these basics. So we've gone over initiative, activating unit, moving, shooting. Uh, we already talked about fray. So all of these happen in the same turn. So you activate the unit, you're going to perform the operations. You get to shoot with them. If they're close enough, you get to fray if you would like. Um, as a co or not covenant anymore, enlightened player, fray is not my friend. No. I have found out. <laughs> Everything is like fray one in covenant. Yeah. We're a bunch of nerds with with cool space, you know, cool boats. Leave us alone. Yep. Um, and then there are, I guess, the the SRS tokens to talk about. Yeah. So the short range squadrons. So there are a bunch of different versions and flavors of them, right? So they can take uh, uh, take shape as like you know standard airplanes and submersibles. They can take shape as like uh, uh, whales, right? So killer whale squadrons um, or what have you. But basically, the I way said. it works is you have a deploy value or SRS capacity is what it's called. Um, mm -hmm. And then during operations phase, so let's say you have an SRS capacity of eight. And during your operations phase, you may take eight tokens and distribute them amongst friendly or enemy ships within 20 inches as you please. So I may, you know, do one token for eight ships, eight tokens for one ship or anything in between. Um, and so why would you do that? Well, um, if you 
put a token next to a friendly ship that defends it. And that will generally add defense value to that ship if it's under attack. So that represents like, uh, you know, like a bunch of uh, uh, close uh, uh, combat air patrol stuff happening, right? So enemy planes are coming mm -hmm. in, you can fight them with your planes or enemy rockets are coming in, you can, you know, send your little planes to shoot down the rockets that are coming in, that kind of stuff. So you can defend your warships with your SRS um, tokens. And then attacking uh, enemies is basically like, well, at the end of the, um, at the end of the turn during the end step, you resolve all the SRS attacks. So you can basically stack up a bunch of planes and stuff, cripple something to reduce its defenses, and then send in all your SRS tokens and obliterate it. Right? So that's something you can do. And then SRS tokens uh, basically roll you know, some number of dice per thing, and depending, depending on the type of token. So that's how they differentiate. So most tokens can deploy out to 20 inches. Uh, some deploy out to 15, but they're generally stronger, um, things like that. Yeah, it's nice because it gives you, I mean, it gives you a little bit of flexibility. We're going to put these these buffs, basically. And yes, Grizzly Troll, the USA still has paddle steamboats. Yeah, they do. They look so cool. I mean, I, I guess they're, they're fine. I really, I really like them. Um, it's a hard choice because I only want to have two fleets. Uh, it's a really tough choice between uh, the Crown and the Union. And it's really just like, ooh, the Crown's pretty cool, but paddle boats. True. True. <laughs> I can't argue so with that. Let's uh, before we before we move on to our interview, let's kind of wrap up our thoughts about the game. For me, um, I thought I was really surprised by how quick the game was to learn. You know, we've played uh, we've played Drop Fleet together. I used to play Battlefleet Gothic back in the day. Um, we've all tried different uh, fleet games, you and I, yep. over over time, and. This game went really quick. You know, like you said, we played three games in an evening and we never played before. Yeah, which is kind of astounding. I mean, we got rules wrong. We did a bunch of rules lookups too. Sure. Yeah, so here, here's our here's our three frigates versus three frigates game. It went by in like 15 minutes, mostly because you shot the shit yes. out of me immediately. So it turns out that Covenant is super freaking good in close range and they just delete stuff. So I was like, yeah. how does shooting work? You go ahead, Adam. I'm still reading the rules. And I look up and he's like, I rolled 40 hits. And I'm like, my guy's yeah, like, dead. Is this normal? I don't know. Did we do it right? <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's the thing. Um, let's see, you know, and then, and then, and then the second mission was really fun to sort of teach you about, uh, sorry, the first, the first uh, campaign mission is apparently the story of the hunt for the Prometheus is that the, the Russians stole the Prometheus, which is like a fancy Antar uh, Antarctican ship. And yeah. then um, I'm trying to run away with it. And so my, my goal was to just like thread the needle straight through all of Adam's stuff. Uh, and I started, I started, it started going okay. And then it started going very not okay. And then <laughs> I was very dead. Talented. Yeah, immediately dead after that. So his, his tiny little ships obliterated my giant ship because they just pump out so many dice. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good time. It was fun. I mean, it, you know, the the first the first couple of, you know missions are really based around learning. Yeah, learning yeah. The... I mean, we're pretty sure that this Prometheus escape mission, where I have to exit the other side of the playfield, is not mathematically. I don't achievable. think it's mathematically possible. Yeah, just like, just on the number of turns you have to move, the distance you have to move. Yeah, right. Like I my, but... I don't move that fast, and we even like we probably cheated a little bit. And I was like, well, how am I supposed to do this? We like looked through all the generators, and I was like, what generators give you additional movement? I'm gonna take all of them. And like, yeah, I, right, you have three of those now. Yeah, and it was like, I don't think I can do this, even if I'm like, you know, doing nothing but going as fast as I can. But you know, it's 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 there to show you how the guns work and how movement works and all that stuff. So it's totally fine. It's not meant to be winnable. It's 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 a it's a yeah. training mission. Um, you know, it's like it's like the first it's the first mission of a video game where like the uh, the the big bad shows up and like wipes half your party and it, like sets up the rest of the story, kind of thing. Right, right. Um, but then we played we played like a, a real game. Um, so it's kind of like a quadrant control sort of situation where we deploy in opposite quadrants. This is a four by four infinity table, just to give you a sense of scale. Obviously not a lot of terrain because we don't have terrain built for this yet. We just stole some infinity stuff. Um, basically we deploy in opposite quadrants and opposite corners. And then we want to scan as many quadrants that do not have enemy ships in them as possible. And each one of those scans is three points. So that's pretty impactful. Um, so it kind of creates this like swirling motion like whoever decides to go clockwise or counterclockwise first sort of sets the sets the direction and then you uh -huh. just kind of run around tagging all the quadrants while sniping at each other um no yeah, it, it was a lot of fun i ended up upgrading my uh i mean apparently the russians can get rail guns and i was like yes please 
I want yeah, I'll have all those. the railguns. And so it has it has a special rule called extreme range. So most things end at 30 inches. Well, extreme range extends the the, lo the longest range bands from 20 to 30 to 20 to 40, which is a pretty big deal. Um, with no penalty, right, to the to yeah. the last range yeah, band. Yeah, no so further penalty. I was just like sniping crap at like 40 inches, and it felt real good. Uh, not not so, not so much for Adam, but uh, that's the thing. Um, it was educational. It was educational, right? And they're very <laughs> expensive. They're like 10 points, so uh, it, it's not like a it's not like a thing you can spam. I don't think. Um, but we sort of just sort of like watched how things evolved with like a little bit of terrain. So like line yeah, of fire is blocking stuff. Yeah. Um, and then we discovered that my frigates are absolute monsters at mid range. Um, oh God, yeah, that was. Um, yeah, you can see that pile of hits there. All but one of those is a two or an exploding hit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was twenty five hits right there. Right. So this illustrates why you would want to support. So uh, most frigates have a rule called pack hunter or pack tactics or something. And basically, if you have more than three ships involved in a support action, then you get additional die. So I was like, I yeah. have five. I'll just do that thing. And they all have guns and then broadsides. So I fired all the guns at one cruiser and all the broadsides at the other cruiser. And I generated a stupid pile of dice. And I was able to citadel and also like do multiple points of damage. And between all the critical hits I did and all that stuff, it just I I one shot two cruisers in one activation, basically. Um, it was ugly. It was it was it was glorious. So there's there's one cruiser gone, and uh, the other cruiser that's <laughs> another enormous pile of of hits. So and so that first one was twenty five hits. This one is twenty seven hits. Yeah, and it just poof gone. <laughs> so so yeah, they got deleted. Yep. Uh, or sorry, twenty nine hit. Ooh. Yeah, but then you deleted me. So your your frigates are absolute monsters at close range, and this and is right fast. before. And they're they're twenty move twelve inches. So all of my frigates just disappeared off the map. Uh, but then at that point, I had my my cruisers far away, and they have railguns. So as you were chasing you around the map, I was just like plinking at you with railguns and saying, "Stay away, go yeah. away." Blasting them off the table. Yep. It was a. Uh, it was yeah. It was really enjoyable. Like I said, we played those three games mm -hmm. back to back. Really, I mean, we obviously made mistakes. We neither yeah. one of us was using SRS, but for how much we learned and how short an amount of time, I was impressed by the yep. game design. Um, the the game is a interesting combination where it has simple to learn mechanics that kind of get out of the way of the strategy of playing the game. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's. There's all these rules used in Infinity and in 40K and basically most games that all just are modifiers to lethality. And they just like streamlined it. It's just dice. Yep. Different guns roll different dice at different ranges. That's it. Some abilities give you more dice. Some abilities take away dice. That's it. There's no plus one to hit versus plus one to wound versus plus one armor state. Like they, they really um, distill it down in sense. Dice only have hits on half the sides. You know, adding one dice does not add a huge modifier. Right. Um, so it's pretty, pretty smart in that game design. Uh, for me, what it does, the, the game checked all the boxes I have of what I want from a fleet scale game. Mm -hmm. Right. I want squadrons of boats. Check. Right. That's the easy one. And then it's like, I want, um, I want boarding actions. Check. Which is fray. It happens all the time. Uh, yeah, this is a, a boat with close combat game, which is kind of hilarious. You know, steamboat me closer so I can hit them with my sword. Um, I want cool critical effects. Mm -hmm. right? Like that's always fun in, you know, in Battlefleet Gothic or in Drop Fleet when you hit the ship and then you know, they're literally just like it does in this game. Their reactor goes nuts and it explodes and takes out ships next to it. Like that's a thing that can happen in this game. Um, and so it it really it really hits all those marks that I like, but the rules are easy enough to get out of the way of the game. Yes, entirely so. As, As uh, you know, after we played it, and the more we've kind of digested it, the more I've I've liked it. Mm -hmm. um, especially when I think about comparing it to other space games or other fleet games that I've played, where I'm like, huh, I really liked how that worked in this game. 
Yeah, it's it's nice because like there's you don't have to remember damage values or anything. Like you can you can just pick look at this table and then kind of figure out what it does. So if you look at the molecular deharmonizer, effectively what it needs to do is like just reading this right now. It's the first time I've looked at it. Is it wants to support other stuff, but its initial value is so bad, right? It's like three. So yeah, basically, so if what's, you have, yeah, you need you to have, have two. one. You're rolling three dice. Yeah, you need to have two to roll thirteen. Right. Or three to roll twenty three. So like you you want a ton of these firing at one target. Right. And it will it will wreck stuff. Um, so they've 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 added like this this represents a huge um, variety in weapons and the the way they feel on the table just from this one table, which I really like. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's simple. You don't have to like remember what DA and AP and all that other stuff does. You just you just look at this. You're like, okay, makes sense. And then generally, when you're shooting, there isn't a whole lot of mathing out stuff. You're just like, I want more dice over here. This feels roughly the right amount of dice because you you know how many hits you need, right? To 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 do something. And there's there's not really much in the way of like uh, crazy crits coming back at you and like ruining your turn and stuff. Um, so that that's a, that's a nice thing right. too. And a lot of these mechanics are also really easy to learn. So if yep. I remember, like uh, homing is you reroll blanks. Yep. And guided you reroll shields, mm -hmm. and sustained you reroll anything that's not a hit. Right. And fuselage so you reroll you reroll shields. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, fuselage you reroll yep. shields. So like the a lot of the mechanics are really simple. Piercing just means that if you cause damage at all, you you um sit it out them. Right. Boom. Yep. Right. It's um, so really easy stuff. Yeah, I I really appreciated how much the game, the rules got out of the way of the game. Yeah, and now and then you the and you end up focusing all of your attention on um, positioning, planning for your next turn, uh, figuring out what your activation yeah. order needs to be. You're like, okay, I can't move these frigates or I can't move these cruisers because Adam's like death frigates are over there and if i move them they'll be closer then they'll be in range so, and because there's because there's a lot of um because pre-measuring is allowed you can just like measure it and be like oh i don't want to move i'm just going to drift and stop and then you won't be in range for your your doom gun that like murders me at close range with eight dice or whatever so um mm -hmm. i think it lets you it makes you lets you make good decisions and lets you feel in control and uh because it's a d6 game where you're just like piling hits on right you you have a there's not like a huge amount of math or or figuring stuff out it's like just more dice is more good and then then you just do it and uh you know it lets you it lets you focus on the fun part which is like my boat goes over here and i pull this cool maneuver around the thing and then i shoot torpedoes at you and i win right that's that's sort of what i want from yeah. a, a fleet game and then if it doesn't go well right uh we finished three games in like two hours two hours two hours yeah uh, just like us being bad at the game that's pretty yeah. good fail fast get to get a couple games in or just like finish fast, go get go get a beer or something, right? So that's all that's all pretty good, I think. Yeah, I think we'll definitely be playing uh, more of this in the near future. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's, I want to actually want to play through the rest of the the rest of the intro campaign. We absolutely should. I'm excited to do that. Well, great. So there there you guys have it. Our first reactions and thoughts to playing uh, drop uh, sorry drop <laughs> dystopian wars. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would recommend it if you have friends that are interested in boat games or mm -hmm. that you want to get interested in boat games. It's not that expensive. Uh, yep. That's another thing that I was pretty surprised by is like the, the, the squads of models are very reasonable. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to think of like 25 bucks for a couple of cruisers and a handful yep. of frigates. They look great. They go together great. Um, it is one thing is if you're like a diehard naval fan, right? Like you really like complicated naval war games. This is not that. Uh, it's like arcade yeah. mode, I guess, right? It, it it gets at the 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 thinking parts of the game without getting bogged down in simulation detail on it, which is hard to do. And they've definitely chosen to push it more towards like the arcade side, which is fine if that's what you're looking for. But just as a as an upfront disclaimer of what what it is and what yeah, it is not. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. If if it is not a simulationist game. Yeah, it is very much a miniature strategy game mm -hmm. about boats. Yep, I mean, I this uh, does not scratch the my you know naval ball cap side, right? Like I I want something more crunchy, but this definitely gets me most of the way there. And it get, it gets enough, it gets enough for me to uh, sit down and play one of those with you. Right, exactly. So, so it works well. Indeed. Well, great. So now that we have shared everyone with our with our first uh, thoughts, 
we have a little bit of bonus content. We didn't have a sound bite. I thought about recording one with Gene. <laughs> but um, yeah, so tonight we are going to be sharing with you all an interview that we did with uh, with Aaron and Melanie about their very first ITS tournament ever. So this is what it is like if you are a totally brand new person getting to Infinity and playing in ITS. Right. So just as a quick note, this is a new style of content we're trying. Please let us know what you think. Uh, you know, Aaron and Melanie, thank you again for helping us test this format out. Uh, it allows us to... Pigs. Hmm? Yeah, the guinea so pigs. Yeah, exactly. Pigs. Uh, it allows, but the, the key point is this will allow us to do things like interview people in Europe or like New Zealand or something, right? Uh, it'll let us do weird time zones at times that are, are more amenable for our guests and also bring you the content during the live show. We'll still be here chatting with you in Twitch, so we're not going anywhere. Um, but yeah, enjoy, enjoy the interview. We'll be, we'll see enjoy you. Us. Enjoy us. Yeah. Right. And Aaron and Melanie, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll be here right alongside. See you in a bit. Who okay. we talked to a couple of weeks ago as kind of a, um, like the experience of a new player coming to infinity and we'd said we'd check in after they went to their first tournament well obi ran a tournament in the bay area and you went yeah it was yeah. great Woo, first yay time. yay i'm i'm a little sad that that i won't be here first but i'm glad that you feel more prepared coming to the rest of your raid obi was a perfectly good first uh tournament organizer so yeah, yeah. he's Very a real cool dude yeah yeah you know, he's, he's fantastic I assume he's in the chat, so hi, Obi. Good job. <laughs> He'll be there, I'm Down sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's let's uh, give a quick little recap just so we can catch people up on what your experience was like. I think this is you know, a, a unique opportunity to, to really talk with people after their first their first event. Yeah. So yeah, first your... first for, to be clear, first infinity tournament ever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah right. okay. And I think for. For me, at least, this is my first time playing somebody other than Melanie, and I yeah, I played one other opponent, but this is the first time really playing more people than basically really close friends. Yeah. Oh wow! wow. Out in the wild. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, great. So let's uh, let's go over the missions really quick first. So Obi picked a, a lineup that I think is a is a friendly lineup. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, we've got Ease round back in. Yeah, exactly. Right. People are getting used to playing in person again. Um, so, yeah, round one was frontline. Round two was capture and protect. And then round three was safe area. Yeah. So I two of these missions, the very least, so frontline and capture and protect are very much rewarding moving across the table. Right. Um, while safe area is more you just occupying the mid zone. But there's still all of that basically means get out of your deployment zone. Uh, it's kind of a get out of your comfort zone kind of sort of actually. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. And also, I think frontline and safe area are scored at the end of the game. So yep. I think there's a lot of similarities there. So it's more about kind of moving up and also not dying at the same time for those ones. <laughs> You've got to hold out to the very end. So, John, do you want to pull up their list so we can go yeah, over? Yeah, sure. Let's like, uh, just take a look at uh, Aaron's list because they're that's the order that they're in. So here we go. <laughs> that's a good reason. Yeah. So I made this list for safe area and then maybe also frontline. Um, I ended up playing it for safe area and frontline. It has two Karakuris because they are ridiculously durable and are specialists and will just you know, in theory, would have been able to just move up, hold a pos uh, position, and not get removed from the board. And then it has a bunch of other just good stuff. Um, you know, the Karakuris are in a, or one of the Karakuris is in a Harris with an engineer to repair it. I've got a Rushi for dealing with anything with, uh, with mimetism. You know, Jimbo's just really good all the time, so I stuck him in there. Same with Kuroshi. Um, Kuroshi also doubles as a specialist, so she can get up somewhere quickly if needs it. Um, and then there's an HMG bot, and there's an Evo hacker to buff things or put on defense against uh, hacking. So yeah, um, that was the general plan. Not bad. I see. I see John's patented Kuroshi arrived your lieutenant made a, made an appearance. <laughs> I think it's the best lieutenant in JSA. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> the Demara Spitfire is a close second, though. Really like Someone's a teacher's friend. <laughs> 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 
That's a, senpai, that's a fun looking list. You? Have you noticed her? What was that? I said senpai. Have you noticed her? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, it's it's, it's, it's this looks like a fun list. I would I would definitely play this. Great, and then uh, your second list. Yep. So this was specifically made for capture and protect. Um, the general idea is. Um, it was specifically made for capture and protect, but it could also double as frontline. Um, the sure. basic idea is Kuroshi charges forward, shoots smoke, grabs the flag, runs back. And you can do that really fast. Um, and then if there's anything in the way that is preventing her from doing that, I have Shinobu and, Onobi and an Oniwaban who will cut those things in half. And then she will be able to advance smoothly and easily. Um, and then I have Ryukin Nines just as big defensive pieces also to shoot out... Um, you know, anything guarding it. And yeah, that's the basic idea. I have a bunch of Keisotsus, but they're kind of, oh yeah, the Kenpai MSB2 in the Keisotsu core, mostly just to uh, watch the flag so nobody does the same thing to me. Yeah, that's smart. Putting uh, something that can see into the smoke that they'll drop on the flag. Yeah. And, and also the Ryukin Nines um, are mine layers, so it just makes it more of a pain for them to get across to my side of the board. Makes sense. I have some questions about this list, but we'll wait till we get to the capture and protect section. Okay. Let's say so you'd say the list is made for both capturing and protecting. Yes. There you go. <laughs> All right. I, I, thank you. Good good work, second. Adam. <laughs> All right, Melanie, let's take a look at your first list. Yeah, so I Two kind of notes before. Um, Aaron and I have found that the most important thing about building lists is making sure your names of the lists are either witty or some kind of joke. Um, so I named all of mine after fashion things since that was the theme of the tournament. Um, both of my lists, actually, the other note I have is that I was having a lot of trouble coming up with two separate lists. So oh, I considered sure. just going with one, but figured that I would instead build one short range and one long range. Um, based on the map, I would in pick which one it was. Um, so both of them are pretty similar with a few little tweaks. Uh, I had a moderator, a defensive moderator core with a cyclone in both of them. Um, mm -hmm. Cyclone had a Feuerbach in one and a Spitfire in the other. Um, and then mo the bulk of my kind of punching and action parts were Zeros, Prowlers, and a Chimera. Um, so yeah. So I'm playing uh, Bakunin, so I got to spam zeros. I took three in each list. I've been finding that I've been able to play with them pretty well. Um, and the Prowler I am noodling with, but it, it's fun to pull that surprise out on people. Mm -hmm. um, the Prowler Spitfire is a monster when people aren't ready for it. It's yeah, so, so good. Um, yeah, and so basically then I took two hackers in each, and a lot of repeater coverage. Because I've been finding that if you can get turn one and throw up a repeater network, it's really strong for nomads, even if you're just uh, spotlighting things. Mm -hmm. I mean, just spotlighting. Spotlighting terrifies me now. John has, has I've, hurt I've, me. Yeah, I've you know, made you <laughs> yeah. very sad. Um, that, looks, I mean, that looks like a fun list. I really like that you, you went full bore leveraging camo. Right, so you've got three camo markers, one hidden deploy right off the bat, and then you've got your uh, your Reverend Custodier, which also has ODD, so you just have a lot of Viz mods out there. Yep, I want it to be hard to hit with a defensive core that could hold things down if need be. Yeah, I, I gotta say, though, in N4, the ability to add a Cyclone to the link has completely changed that moderator link. Oh my god. Because before it was like, you can have a sniper rifle on this guy? And it's like, eh, I don't know. I don't know if I want that. Yep. It's real expensive. But now, I, now you get to babysit a cyclone. Now you get to babysit yeah. a cyclone, yeah. And there's plenty well, of excellent uh, excellent um, engineers. That's what I was looking for in, in Bakunin. Yeah. So. yeah, and so the cyclone was really good for having that X visor in the pitcher. So yeah. that when I'm in my repeater network, I can just get a uh, repeater wherever the hell I need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you have one, two, three, four pitcher sources in this list, and then the zero with depth rep. Yeah. So, like, there's going to be a repeater somewhere. Yeah. And it actually worked out well because my opponents were forced to kill re waste orders killing repeaters rather than doing sure. something more, either killing my units or focusing on objectives. 
that's, that's an great. interesting discussion about like order advantage, right? Because if you can put out two repeaters and they have to kill both, it takes you one order with pitchers and it takes them two orders. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> It, it, yeah. I mean, it takes them two orders if they can draw a line of fire in the first order. Sometimes they have to maneuver sure. around, avoid it. Yep. No, you, Very true. you have you have made me waste many orders killing repeaters. <laughs> it's true. Repeaters are fun. I like them. I'm sad that Ariadne does not get them, but oh well. So I just pulled up your second list, and spoiler, I like it more. Yeah. So this because uh, <laughs> of double split. prowler. Is that why? Yes. <laughs> So I got rid of the Reverend Custodier and replaced it with a moderator hacker as my second hacker to have a little bit of hacking, a little more hacking power. Um, mm -hmm. The Cyclone switched to a Spitfire over a foyer box, so it's a little shorter range, but still can pack a punch. And the big change is that I put in a second uh, Prowler, which one with a boarding shotgun, one with a Spitfire, and I figured I could use that uh, for like front lines who surprise people in the middle of the board and hold it down. Plus, it's automatically almost 80 points just in sitting in the middle of the board <laughs> front line. Yeah, right? This is my zone. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah, that, that does provide a ton of points. Mm -hmm. And it's a ton of points that you can hold back until the very end, even if you need, if mm -hmm. you want to. Yep. Interesting. No, yeah, I like this. Yes, yeah, so you still have the two mod uh, the two prowlers, your moderator core babysitting the Cyclone Spitfire, Zoe Pywell, the Meteor Zond, uh, triple zeros, and and I see you you can't you don't have a favorite zero, <laughs> so you just go with one of everything. Well, then she my, has the correct zero in there. My favorite is the um, I have changed that since the deployable repeater with the EM mines. It did great in the tournament, and it, yeah, it's so yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that one. I hate it, I hate it, I hate That's it. That's why it's my favorite. Yes. John has a wonderful battle report where basically that thing like soloed my avatar. I yeah. zest uh, Aaron's um, Oyuroi with it in one yep. of our games. And, shot. Shot. and then shot it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, man. Yep, and then the, the camera, uh, the camera, 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 whatever, camera. Um, and the Morlock. Perfect. Fun lists. Yeah, I like definitely. it. So fashion line and fashion disaster. Perfect. Yes. There was also fashion Nista, fashion premiere, and like four other ones that uh, did not make the cut. Yeah. This is the, I guess, the tournament title card. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, we did that a little while ago. Yeah. It was fun was watching cool. him like make that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So. Let's talk about how your games went, and then we can dig a little bit more into your overall impressions of the tournament. So round one was Frontline. And Melanie, why don't you start us off with your experience yeah. there? I was playing against uh, TAC, and we basically had a very similar list. Um, it was like four camo markers versus four camo markers. Right. Um, so. A lot of what I did was defensive, and I figure with frontline you can just hold the if you can get the two the the closest and the middle one, then you you get the points you need. So most of it focused on getting my infiltrators onto that middle section and then holding things down with my defensive core or other things along those lines. Pywell's pretty good for having sensor and watching for stuff and uh, being close. Um, I ended up losing the game by I think nineteen points. Um, or 19 oh. in the middle section. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, Pywell was one millimeter literally from being in the middle section. Oh, and oh my that hurts. Yeah. My meteor on that uh, was dropping to destroy the whole core link of the other side lost by one on the drop. So I rolled a, a 12 instead of an 11, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, lost that completely. Oh, the other thing. Oh. Was, Good in that game. Uh, the Cyclone Spitfire really held down the center board. Um, got the pitcher repeater up, really helped a lot, and then went face to face with uh, Veteran Kazakh HMG mm. and took it down three times because it kept getting back up with a paramedic roll. And then I would it would come back at me and just kept getting killed by it. Interesting. So they let it. So they went to NWI and then picked it back up. Yeah. Interesting. So it was it was always Huh. That's their... that's, that's ballsy. Yeah, they peek out um from a wall and basically 
take the shots at me. I rolled better, or the cyclone just happened to roll better, took it yep. down, and then their core link shot a medikit at it, and they did that twice. Wait, did it go unconscious, or did it... I think it, it must have gone unconscious. Because if it went on... So, Vet Kazakhs have NWI, which right. means uh, if it was... That's... Because... Huh. Interesting. Because if he's ever one wound, you go NWI. If yeah. he's ever another wound, you go dead. Yeah. So, I mean... It, yeah. It was not dead. It was definitely... So, it must have been NWI, because it kept getting... It kept getting res. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. huh. Well, okay. Here's my, I guess here's NWI my is tip. optional. Right? Yeah. Hmm. Here's, anyway. a, here's my tip for you for frontline. And this is where you'll never have the pylo problem again. You ready? Okay. Deploy your HVT at the line that divides the two zones. That's a really good tip. Um, <laughs> yes, my opponent, I think, did that and just deployed the HVT towards the center and then said, I hope you don't need to get the HVT for your cost fight objective. Right. Um, and I did. I spotlit it twice and got my mm. classified points. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's what his strategy was as well. That's, yeah, that's that's the big brain move. That's the, it's a the, good one for biotech four two. So you know you're out. <laughs> yeah, right. I I think this is safe. Oh God, it burns. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's just it's just the the guy at the end of the finish line when you're in a track rate track meet. He's like, oh go go right. That's that's all it yeah. is in biotech four. <laughs> well, great. So Aaron, how did your first round go? Uh, horribly, just uh -oh. the worst. Um, so I played vanilla Yuxing. And I was playing against a heavy camo list. Mm -hmm. And one of their camo pieces was the Hacktow HMG, which I have learned to hate. Mm -hmm. um, and I got completely trashed. Um, I ended up going 09, and I had 31 points left of people on the board at the end. It was, it was yeah, it went really badly. But I did learn a lot about, you know, how much I hate Hacktows. So, yep. <laughs> I think the main thing that happened was there were a lot of places where I thought I was more in cover than I was, and mm. just because the terrain was weird angles, and I also probably just had you know beginning of the day tournament nerves and wasn't sure, really sure. And everything, so I wasn't playing as carefully as I should have been, and yeah, just ended up getting wiped off the board. It makes you feel better. Statistically, the best game to lose is the first game. So we can talk <laughs> about that. that yeah. because... <laughs> okay. So, but uh, you know, this is your your first time venturing out and in playing against someone who isn't sitting next to you, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of interesting tools in this game, and the Hawktow HMG is is one of them. Swiss Guard is a is a very similar unit. It's it's yep. just a one. One point higher ballistic skills, same thing out of Panoceana. Yep. Um, they're they're assholes. <laughs> they are. So I played around an army, and I know a lot of the kind of scariest stuff, and probably in a lot of the armies. But yep. Hanna Yujing, I just their their units look very boring to me, so I don't really know all of them. Yawn, <laughs> heavy infantry, something, something. <laughs> I don't know. This guy just got power armor. He's got a gun and armor, and this guy's also got a gun and armor, and they're all really good at shooting. Yeah, pretty much it. Yeah, that sounds uh, about including right. Including the hawk now. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, lesson learned. <laughs> so. I, also, my opponent was, uh, he was somewhat, I think he was pretty experienced, and he knew to target my Rushi first so mm -hmm. that I couldn't his uh hacktow and that worked well for him he took down my rushi i didn't really have a i kept trying to bring it back up and he kept knocking it back down so yeah exactly. he played well and i played poorly oh, no. yeah i mean like facing somebody who knows what your what the threats are and then they dismantle them uh and mm -hmm. they keep the pressure up right that's that can be really hard especially when you're just like i've never had this happen in this way before this is weird yeah. But but I think you you know it, it it sounds like you approached it the right way where it's like this is this is going to be educational. Yeah, <laughs> I I probably learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't feel bad about it even though I got completely destroyed. So yeah, excellent. That's the right attitude. 
So how did Capture and Protect go? Um, actually, okay, so the biggest problem, again, I lost, but I felt really proud of this game because the reason I lost was we ran out of time, um, okay. which we're going to talk about later. Um, yeah. And it was a little bit me being slow, but a little bit him being slow, too. Mm, um, yeah. Mine kind of, it was versus Aleph, Vanilla, or no, OSS. Mm -hmm. um, and my army, so the repeater network again kicked ass. Um, my army completely dismantled his, basically. My mm -hmm. Chimera uh, close combated his Asura and ripped it to shreds. Oh, um, well my done. Spitfire Prowler popped out and killed his uh, Dakini Link. Like, it was... I was doing great. I was ready to win that game. Um, and I think we actually have pictures of the board and such that I included. But um, Is this that Eugene board? Yeah, it's the Eugene board. Yeah, so that's the one we were playing on. Um, in this picture, I was on the top side heading to the south side. I did not capture. I did protect. He did a major rush um, trying to get the flag towards the end of the game uh, with the, his last orders because he couldn't, we were running out of time. We only got through the end of turn two. Okay. Um, he won by one point because he finished his classified objective. And the big thing that I, the reason I couldn't, um, I needed to coup de gras somebody and all of my melee was going too well. So my chimera kept murdering dead off the board. Um, so I kept, and the other, like everything I hit kept just killing it. So I couldn't get to a downed body to coup de gras because everything was dead. <laughs> That's a bummer. Yeah. I mean, Gordon's yeah. Board, though. Yeah. Aaron and I put that one together using their scenery. <laughs> <laughs> a really nice table. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we definitely, uh, we'll definitely touch on the, the, the timing uh, at the end here. Um, yeah. So Aaron, your round two. So my round two, because I was so thoroughly defeated in round one, I was playing the other person who was at the bottom of the tournament. And they were a newer player playing, or a maybe less experienced player playing uh, Vanilla Combine. And they were playing an avatar list. Um, okay. My, okay. I got to go first and I did exactly what my list was supposed to do, which is um, my Oniwabon appear to kill their total reaction bot, um, their total reaction HMG bot. Uh, Hiroshi Rider drove up, threw smoke, picked up the flag, drove home. Um, and then... Clockwork. Yeah, it worked perfectly. Everything you know went off without a hitch. Uh, my opponent pushed forward with his avatar, and then um, I had Shinobu in hiding to come up, and on all my second turn, got to cut it in half. And oh, yeah. That's like that's uh, like the JSA player's dream, right? It's like do the thing I need to do on turn one, chill out. They move their big stompy tag forward right next to Shinobu, and you're just like shink. I, I think my entire second so there was a path that like forked. And if he had gone one way rather than the other way, I could have uh Shinobu an ARO and just killed him there. But he went the other way and just barely made it so I couldn't attack uh out of hidden deployment. And so I had to spend basically my whole second turn walking Shinobu up to the Avatar to cut it in half. But then it got there and just, you know, crit twice. So it was pretty good. Ooh, Ooh. woof. So, so you, you held Shinobu back until round two. You didn't go for the, the turn one uh, instant Shinobu to the butt of the Avatar. So Shinobu was in the same order pool as Kuroshi, and I was smart and played the objective and did not decide to waste all of my orders, you know, charging up to go kill something when I could just run up and grab the flag and run away. How dare you? <laughs> it's worth noting, Obi let us know that Aaron was the only one who captured the flag. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the tournament. Well so done. there you go. And I got all six of my capture points for holding the flag every round. I mean, Damn. that's a that's a hard freaking mission. Yeah. Like in general, just well, getting it's, the it's hard. Like, yeah, if you go back and watch our episode on it, like we straight up tell you, that, like, don't bother doing it on the first turn. It's not worth it. But if you can just like only wob on something in half and then just like roll up. Oh, my goodness. I'm so telling you, man, before, before you rider. before you cut the avatar into pieces, were you at least a little afraid of the avatar? Uh, no, because I had Shinobu. So I deployed first. And I deployed so Shinobu. you're cocky is what you're saying. You're like, oh. okay. So I deployed Shinobu first. Uh, my opponent didn't have any sensor. 
And um, bring sense to kids. Let this be a lesson to you. Yeah. Um, and then because Shinobu, because I had deployed first, I just got lucky that he had deployed his avatar like basically right in front of Shinobu, but around a building. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just thought, you know, oh, it's going to walk forward. And if it does anything, I'll just jump out and cut, uh, chop it in half. And it worked. That's super yeah. dangerous. I might not have jumped out on his turn. No, yeah, I didn't. But okay. yeah. But um, I did, so I wanted to touch on your list really quick. I would make one change, and okay. that is to drag Yojimbo into the second group and make no other changes. Um, mm-hmm. I have a lot of, I, I, yeah, um, that is a thought. <laughs> yeah, I, there were, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to go into it because, like, you could talk about this list for a while. I think. Um, well, no, no, no. I yeah. mean, but I mean, like, like, what you you seem hesitant. I and I'm sure there's a good reason. So, what what's your thought there? As so, to why? um, so first off, the so, I think the main idea was that both Kuroshi and Yojimbo are doing similar things, mm-hmm. and so, um. If you're so ideally, you want to go first, and so if you're going first, you're going to have to deploy at least one of your bikes first. Mm-hmm. And so, if you put them on opposite sides of the map, mm-hmm. then it might be that only one side of the map is accessible. So you're going to have to, you know, they both have smoke; they can both drive up and grab the flag. So if they're on different sides of the map, you still want that whole order pool to be able to power one of them so they can go grab the flag first. Or if one of them goes up and dies, if one of them goes up, grabs the flag, comes back halfway and dies, then the other one can come up and grab it. And so you want the more orders being able to power both of them, was my thought. Okay, that's a fair fair counterpoint. Uh, Then I I would counter with move Yojimbo and the Oniwaban to group two. Because, okay, let let me me rephrase this question. What Uh are you doing with your orders in group two? What did you spend your orders on turn one doing? Um, Not a lot. And that was kind of an issue, and I'm not exactly sh- so. I think, I think if I played this again, um, I would probably want to downgrade the. So, I mean, okay. What if you just moved you know, the Oni Waban to Group Two? That's it. Yes, that would probably be good. Because um, you're not, your Jimbo is not getting that order anyway. And neither is Kuroshi Ryder. Yeah. So the one of the things, though, is that... So I, like you said in your episode on Capture and Protect, I wasn't expecting to be able to capture the flag on turn one. Mm. And so turn one, a lot of times, is going to be Shinobu or the Oniwaban eating up a lot of orders to dismantle defenses. And then turn two is Kuroshi riding in. Mm-hmm. Um, the yeah the group two is kind of clunky and i think maybe what the thing to do would be to like eliminate the entire group two and change the keisutsu core into something else um because the group two is not doing a lot i mean i think group two i guess i guess my my the the main thing i'm trying to arrive at here uh Mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps i should stop just dancing around it is that group two looks like it's doing doesn't really have a lot of tasks for turn one Right, I mean, you could. I mean, you're certainly not going to like drive a Keitotsu or the Flash Pulse bot up and be like, "Let's go!" <laughs> like that's not happening. So, right? so actually, sorry, so I remember what Group Two is for. Group okay, two yeah, yeah, is, go for it. If you get so, um, you've talked about this before. The Ryukin Nine SMG is great at shooting out of your um, deployment mm-hmm. zone, mm-hmm. and so if you need to shoot out of your deployment zone, the Ryukin Nines are there to do that. Mm. Um, so basically. Either the Ryukin Nines or Shinobu and the Oniwaban are going to be clearing a path for Kuroshi Rider or Endo Jimbo. Um, if what I've experienced is if you're using Shinobu or the Oniwaban to be clearing that path, they need a lot more orders, whereas the Ryukin Nine need significantly fewer. So the Ryukin Nines are shooting anything that's up for ARO if they're the proper tool for that. Shinobu and the Oniwabans are doing that if they're the right tool, and then you can get the motorcycles to go in and uh, capture the flag. Fair. Take it. 
Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's it's totally valid, nice. right? I just I had a thought. I wanted to see what your your counterpoint was, and yeah. well reasoned. I had forgotten it first because yeah, I, the tournament's over, so I don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> right? Like, all right, brain <laughs> off. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I mean, all right. So final round, we had uh, safe area. Mm -hmm. I didn't play this one. Uh, my opponent left after the second game. So I I was at the bottom of the tournament, so I got a bye, um, which bumped up my scores, my tournament score significantly. Um, but yeah, so I spent the whole time kind of tinkering with my lists and kind of digesting the things I had. Um, I learned from the other ones. Uh, Obi had offered to play me in a game. But after two games of kind of being all amped up with adrenaline, I didn't really want to go against one of the better players in the league. Um, so I, you know, I kind of just watched other people and played with my list. So, so what I will say is that this is this is why I feel like if even if you're having a bad day, because like so this person at this point, you were 0 and 2. That person was probably also 0 and 2. And and I you know, I I don't know why they might have left, but like a lot of people just say like ah oh, fuck it and leave. And like what that does is it gives other people uh, a possibly a negative game experience. Like it sounds like you made the best of your time, but you know a lot you know, like if you if you've traveled across the country to go to a tournament and you don't yeah. even get to play the last round, and you're like cool. So neat. Yeah. I'll just I'll just go to hang out for two hours and wait for awards. Like where I didn't win because I'm at the bottom table. <laughs> like, yeah. Like that's that's that is a bummer. So I'm sorry that happened at your first event. Um, but yeah, it's this is a a big why you don't do that. Right. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, you know, if that guy was so that was the person who I should have been his avatar. Um, and you know, if if you had to leave for legitimate reasons, you know, sure. Maybe some yeah, emergencies what happened. the time was. And yeah, if he was so utterly defeated, like, yeah, I don't I don't think we want to force him to play a third game if that's the case. But I yeah, for a big tournament, if we're going to Rose City Raid or something, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 uh, like sorry, you were saying? Nothing. <laughs> no. Um but I, I mean I I think to Obi's credit, he handled it the best way a tournament organizer yeah. could, right? He had somebody lined up himself to handle an odd player situation he offered and you were like i'm i'm done for the day i've had enough fun right like i want to chill and relax and that's totally valid right and so i think i mean like we have we're we you know for rose city raid we make sure to have somebody lined up in case this happens right like if we can line somebody up i will bring miniatures or adam will bring miniatures in case like you know somebody's like i feel sick i have to stop playing which is also totally reasonable um mm -hmm. So those are all like, and, and if there's a legitimate emergency, right? Like go, right. We've had that happen in tournaments before. Um, it's a game, go tend to the emergency. Um, but yeah, like if you, if you have a choice though, like it's an, and it's just like, I don't, I kind of don't want to, um, you are maybe making somebody else's day also bad. So just sort of be like, Hey, I've had it like be upfront. I've had a bad day. I just lost two or three games in a row. You want to just, chill and like have a casual game and like just shoot the shit and have fun and like come in with a non-competitive attitude then you know maybe that'll work out yeah yeah at that point i mean on the bottom table you shouldn't have a strongly competitive like oh you know, like yeah come on guys like we're, we're at this point we're, we're learning we're here for the experience but yeah and, and to the community's credit uh, I have noticed that the people that have the most fun at tournaments are in the bottom half. Because, like, the pressure's <laughs> off. They're drinking. It's like, yeah, oh, well, yeah. And then, like, I should tell you what happened in my last game, right? Like, my avatar got cut in half by Shinobu. That sucked. It was so cool, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> All right, so, Aaron, how did your, your final round then go? So, my last round went pretty well. Um, I was playing against the OSS player that Melanie had played in her first second, second game. Second game. Yeah. Round, yeah. Um, and yeah, it went pretty well. My uh, So I brought my double Karakuri uh, Rushi list. The Rushi walked up and dismantled the, uh, spent the first turn basically dismantling their Dakini core, mm. um, which was Ooh, great. That is, that is what Rushi is for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it took out four of their bikinis, but they had a what's her name? Uh, Trisha. Trisha. There you oh, go. Oh sure. Um, my opponent spent his first turn uh, reviving all of the bikinis with Trisha. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> uh, had to make had to um and ended up using all of his command tokens reviving oh, them and then, and then also reforging the link. Mm-hmm. So then. That was most of his first turn. He then also pushed his Asura up. My second turn, Yojimbo moved up towards the Asura, threw a crazy koala, and then broke up again and shot with his contender. And between the two contender shots that beat the Asura's shot and the crazy koala, took out the Asura in one attack. So that was pretty good. Rude. Uh, yeah. Um, and well, then- like, I just want to point out, your Jimbo just murdered something, but he, without a sword. Yeah. Yes, I know. I, well, I was, the, I was only shooting to cover his approach so he could drive up and cut it in half. <laughs> that I wasn't contender. I really expecting to do anything with this. I don't know. Yeah. That contender but, has killed a lot of stuff for me. It's killed a Noctifer. It's killed uh, uh, a um, what am I looking for? Uh, Montessa, right? Yeah. I I got a I put a wound on a Sphinx. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was, so what I was, yeah, I was not expecting to kill it. And then it was kind of just, uh, oh, that's a good benefit. Um, he had a Naga sniper on a roof that I was having a lot of trouble getting rid of just because it was in cover and it had mimetism and all that stuff. So I um, learned from my Bromat Academy missions and I did an excellent um, coordinated order. <laughs> um, with a Mark 12 Karakuri that was close to it, plus a Karakuri with a Panzerfaust and Eureka oh. Oda with a Panzerfaust all That's shooting beautiful. at it. That's <laughs> beautiful. That's so good. I love it. John, somebody reads your articles. <laughs> they, they write the articles. It's... <laughs> oh, that's um, fantastic. Amazing. And then um, to end the game on my turn three, Karushi Rider wrote up... Um, killed all of the Dakinis a second time and grabbed uh, one of the farther away um, quadrants and because she's and then flipped into suppressive fire to hold it and I ended up winning pretty handily because I had the Karakuri holding one and I had um, Kuroshi Rider holding the other and my opponent and then I ended up uh, using my um, my classified objective card in interference mode to make it so that he wasn't holding any um, quadrants. Well, that's that's amazing. So you yeah. ended you ended zero and or two and zero, oh, or sorry, yeah, two and one. Two and one, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. um, at the end, I ended up placing third out of everyone. Yay! So your, in your first tournament. Yeah. And all it took was reading John's articles and playing JSA the way he does. And <laughs> losing horribly in my first round, like you said. <laughs> the submarine <laughs> in yep. Yeah. So overall, you, you had a good time? You're still coming yeah. to the rest of your aid? It was great. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you know, you know it, who it, didn't have a good time, though? That Asura. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just like, get murdered, like, chopped to pieces by the Chimera, and then, like, it's like, all right, I'm gonna get loaded into new a new lost, right? I got a new body. I'm gonna upgrade this time with close combat techniques. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then your Jimbo comes rolling up. And you're like, okay, I'm ready for this. And your Jimbo's just like, pow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> just like, I can't win. Well, so I think what's really interesting in all of your games, right, is that so uh, Melanie, you had the buy, and then um, Aaron. I I would say your Hawk Tao experience was roughly equivalent to a buy. Um, <laughs> I got hacked out today, so I know your yeah. pain. Right, but you, you, uh, what I would say is, so, uh, Melanie, even though you lost those two games, it actually sounds like that they were you lost, but were, there are things that are really easy to learn and correct for in the future, which is really cool. Yeah, to be able to like understand what was happening there. And really, all of them were extremely close. Um, I lost by one point in each. Yeah. Uh, one objective point, which was really refreshing because I was worried I was going to get blown out all three games. Right. And just being able to be a little bit competitive and be in it was really, it's like, cool. I, I lost all of them, but I feel great about it. Like, I was here, I learned stuff, and I had fun. Well, 
Fantastic. So let's let's move on out a little bit and kind of talk about your your overall experiences. Um, you you had some notes uh, notes about that and then some questions you wanted to ask. So yeah. tell us how was it? Um, yeah, it was great. Um, I think really the first thing I was super nervous the whole time. Um, like super nervous. My hands were shaking. I kept make, knocking over my miniatures um, yeah. as I was playing. So the thing is though. Everybody was super cool. Um, we got had a few minutes beforehand to talk to people and kind of get to know them beforehand. And everybody knew, knew we were new players. Um, they didn't like go easy on us, but they they were okay with us asking questions. They were okay with us being a little bit slow, all of it. And everybody just was super nice and welcoming. Um, it was really great. And also a benefit um, because we're because pandemic has just kind of is winding down, a bunch of other people hadn't played a lot in N4, so there was a lot of just kind of general, you know, if we do anything wrong, you know, let's let's talk about it, we'll figure out what's right. Um, you know, we can check isn't experienced right yeah, now. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I do want to touch on the handshake thing. Uh, it's not just new players. I've been playing this game since N2, and occasionally I'll have tournaments where I, you know, either have too much coffee or I'm too amped up and I'll like do the same thing, like knock over stuff, knock terrain over, drop a die. Like I've like, I have a dice cup. So I'll, like I'll rattle stuff around the dice cup and like dice will fly out and hit stuff. So like, it's totally normal, right? It's not just new yeah. people. It happens to everybody. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think a couple of the other people I overheard talking about how, you know, they were also a little bit nervous, which made me feel better because, <laughs> you know, knowing that other people are, you know, who are experienced and have played a lot and are also, you know, having, you know, beginning of the day jitters was nice just because, yeah, yeah. Well, great. I'm glad that everyone, yeah, no, that's, that's been my general experience, though, in Infinity is that it is especially as far as wargaming communities, it's really open and it tends to be very inviting of new people. Um, you know, I've definitely been doing to Warhammer tournaments where people get like upset that they're facing against someone new. It's like, uh, they don't even know their, their army. How much just, you know, just like, geez, come on guys. Like we're all new. So I'm glad that I'm glad that that worked out. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Kind of next. Thing we have bulleted is really the length of games um, and the pacing, okay. which is really we had when we were <laughs> we practiced a lot for this tournament. Like <laughs> played a game every other night or so. Wow! Oh my uh, goodness! Yeah, okay. we were we because we we didn't want to go in and be totally blank, and, and we had nothing else to do because it was yeah, yeah. there. <laughs> so, um, I will point out that the two guys uh, from Vancouver, right? Uh, mm -hmm. events and half jacks who regularly come and stomp events they live oh together <laughs> yeah just, no, just it's putting absolutely that out there true. They, <laughs> they, out there. yeah the 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 mighty duo from up north they play a lot yeah yeah so. they're real good <laughs> what, what john's saying is we're expecting you to sweep the rose city right now yeah well, yeah my first tournament i don't know what more you expect <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, when we were practicing, we set timers. And so we would set it, we knew we had two hours for a game. We would set a clock for two hours and we never once did it. <laughs> I think we got to about two hours and 15 minutes was our closest-ish. That's pretty good. Um, huh? Yeah, we were, so we were close and we kind of counted on the experienced players being able to move a little faster than us, um, yep. which in general they did. So it, but, I mean, it became really apparent, especially when I was playing someone who wasn't um, super fast. That's when we ran. We didn't even finish turn two. Right. Um, yeah. Sure. And that was yeah. So we have to practice being a little bit quicker. I think having um, knowing a little more of the rules helps, and kind of learning some interactions. We definitely have been playing a few things wrong. So mm -hmm. uh, good to know that we have now playing it correct. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I say a, couple, a couple things that John and I do, and it's it probably looks horrible to an opponent, but um, when we, for instance, when we, a lot of times when we play, like we rarely use tape measures, mm -hmm. um, and it's because you know, a lot of I think this happens a lot when people are newer is that they'll measure and like I am 
19 and a half inches away. And it's like, all that really matters is that you're above 16. Right. right. And that's usually a pretty quick thing to eyeball. Or you can quickly look at something and be like, you are somewhere between eight and 16 inches away. So now you're within my plus three range for a rifle. And those kinds of quick, for me at least, those kinds of quick recognitions of distances help a lot. And then also with movement, you know, if you're standing next to a building and you're just going to move to the corner of that building, you know that that's less than four inches. So you just move instead of getting out a tape measure and all that stuff. And those, and those just little, um, in a way, like the change in, in the that literal gestures you're using of playing the game, right, um, can speed things up a lot. And then the other the other thing for for me at least is uh, fail fast, fail hard. Like it's it is just this is the you know in a tournament setting. Um, this is the first thing that looks good to me. This is what I'm going with. Let's go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like in practice games, it's fine to have like, you know, your takes, you take back. So he's like, oh, that was obviously a stupid thing for me to do. But it's like in a tournament setting, you're like, well, it wasn't obvious enough. You know, <laughs> um, so those are things that I know help me play a little bit quicker. Um, yeah. John, do you have any any easy advice? I mean, we could do a whole episode on speed play. Yeah, I mean, you, you covered it. Uh, I think I think um, maybe not like you don't uh, need to go all the way to like chess clocks. Right. So we've had. Um, Kevin on who's who was uh who was advocating for chess clocks. I think that's totally fine. Uh but the 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 notch down from that is to do what you two did, which is to set a timer for two hours and just see like where do you land? Ballpark it, right? Like are we at three hours and fifteen minutes or did we land at like, you know, two ten? Right. So like how how yeah. far off are we? And then sort of just like think back as to like what took the longest time. And I think if you wanted to, you know, use the splits feature on your stopwatch or something, like measure your deployment time. Um, mm -hmm. So if your deployment time is like an hour, then you need to think about that a little more. Um, and I think uh, one way to speed that up is it's really easy to, you know, like be on the couch or on the toilet or something and just be like fiddling with your list, right? That's what phones are for. You just fiddle, right? Um, what you don't do is you don't deploy that list. And so a lot of times you're like, oh yeah, I have my core, then I'll do this thing. And then you get to it and you're like, I have so many 55 millimeter bases in my deployment zone. <laughs> um, huh. Where do I find it? I can't fit them anywhere that won't immediately get everybody killed by a missile. And so you're like, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but I'm on the tournament ready. Ah, oh, shit. And then you like spend like in the next 20 minutes like eyeballing potential fire lanes. So one of the things I would suggest people to do is if you're good at mental visualization, deploy your list in your mind's eye. If you're not good at that, you have the models, presumably. Get some tissue paper boxes and some textbooks and throw them out onto a table, just your half, and just like plunk them down and see how it feels. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Don't check sight lines. Don't worry about like, like being exactly in coherency. You don't know, leave your tape measure away, right? Just sort of just like put stuff down and sort of build that muscle memory and say like, oh, I kind of want this flanking this piece. I kind of want this over here. I really, my deployment zone is too dense. I need to take more infiltrators, right? So like, that's the kind of thing you need to think about. And then as you build more like patterns in your head of like, you know, plays you can make, it'll become smoother and that lowers your deployment time, but just practice deployment, yeah. right? It's, it's the next thing after like fiddling with lists, just like fiddle with stuff. You, you know, a lot of us are working from home now, right? You have a desk fiddle with fiddle with your miniatures on your desk. Um, yeah, if you don't have the Queen's Gambit level, take some pills, stare at the ceiling for a while yeah. and deploy in your, in your right. head. Like I have a I have a game table that that I often just have set up, and then I will I'll like bust out some models. You're like, oh, what's this list look like? Well, how would I deploy it on here? Yeah. Um, yeah, you don't you don't need to stare at the ceiling at night and dream or not even dream visualize. Don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> Unless they make you good at chess, I guess. Is that the moral <laughs> that's, of the story? That's the lesson of Queen's Gambit. <laughs> what I learned. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, so for, I actually was able to play fairly quickly. Um, I think I was uh, at least on par with most of my opponents for most of my games. Um, and something that really helped me was just playing units that I kind of was more familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, um, John, you gave me this advice. I was trying to, I was debating if I wanted to take Toha or JSA before the tournament. And I ended up playing one of our practice games as Toha, and it was just such a slog. It, it, it felt so much harder to do that 
you know, going with JSA, going with what I knew seemed a lot better. I also mm -hmm. was fiddling with one of my lists and I thought, oh, you know, maybe a Ludon is better, but I just don't have the experience I have with that over the Rushi. So kind of taking things that I know how to use was really helpful for me playing quickly. And then also kind of, you know, in having a plan, knowing what I need to do on each turn, how to execute, all of those things kind of help just make the game move more smoothly. So those were all good for me. I didn't, well, I played slower, but I did have a similar experience in that knowing the units, playing to my strengths, and actually picking units I knew how they worked and how they, I kind of used them really helped make it a lot easier than just kind of throwing, like, oh, I've heard Riot Girls are so strong. Well, right. I can't use, you know, I, I love Riot Girls. I get them killed every time. So I figure better to use zeros because I know a little bit better how they work, and that that helped make things smoother. That's awesome. Well, that's absolutely uh, a a very valid point. Play what you know. Yep. Um, I was gonna say one last little thing I wanted to touch about the timing because this is actually this is almost more relevant uh, than practicing. Is um, sometimes you run out of time, and the goal really is gonna have to be to finish a full play around, so it's going to be finished turn two. So what I do a lot of times is just looking at the clock. If I get the feel that we're, you know, there's only 40 minutes left or you know, 30 minutes left in the round, like this isn't going to go well. Um, I play to win turn two. Yeah. And that's and that's a hard thing because like you, the game is designed to play till turn, you know, play to win on turn three. Right. Your list is designed for that. Your strategy is designed for that. But sometimes like the writing is on the wall. You're like, I've got to turn to this. And I've absolutely had it the other way around where it's like, I played for turn two, we've got 10 minutes left. My opponent is like, come on, let's get another round and they'll let us they'll they'll let us play in between rounds. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> yep. Yep. That happened to Obi and me at uh, yeah. Ragnarok. We were like, oh shit, I guess we're done. We'll stop at turn two. And we looked around and everybody kept going. And we're like, wait, we don't have to do the next round for another hour because there's like a huge break. Do you want to keep going? And at that point, we already made like crazy risks. There was like a Kempe tie, like standing in the open, being like, "Don't shoot! Everything's gonna be fine." Nobody's right. like, "I guess I shoot him." I'm like, "All right." <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's the the only thing you can really actively do. In, yeah. You know, it, it doesn't involve like you know new habits and strategies and stuff like that. It's just like, well, what's it look like? It looks like we have 30 minutes left or 20 minutes left. Like. Okay, this is the turn that's going to matter, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it's also totally fine to tell your opponent, like, "Hey, uh, I, I'm I don't want to be rude. I'm just going to let you know that we've got you know 30 minutes left, and we're at the bottom of turn one." So yeah, yeah. And Obi was really good at keeping people posted about how much time is left. Yeah. And I'm assuming most tournaments are like that, where they just keep you post, like yeah, keep refreshed. generally, yeah. generally. Well, awesome. Then you had a note here about terrain, which is going to be very relevant at the Rose City Raid. Yeah. Yes. So I think um, probably the biggest thing for me, and I assume Melanie as well, is that, you know, we've been playing on our home table with our home terrain. And playing on other tables with different, it was, it was very different. Um, uh -huh. There you three. Know, one thing is it was a lot taller. There were a lot bigger things. Um, just kind of the whole terrain played very differently than I think how we were used to. And also many of the tables had quite different terrain. So it was a kind of, it was a, you know, I wouldn't say jarring experience, but it definitely did shape how the games went and how our, uh, how at least my lists did in yeah. some cases. But I think this is where, where Melanie, you were talking about how you built two different lists and you're like, I don't know, a short range one, a long range one. And I don't know if we did it consciously, but like short range and long range is an, is another way of saying high density, low density. Yeah. yeah, and that's kind of what I was leaning toward. Um, I didn't pick my list until I saw the map, and then it was like, okay, this is really cramped. I'm going to use my short range list, um, yeah. short range list, or this is really the um, the JSA board we played had a lot of open spaces. And so it's like, okay, my long range one is going to go okay here because I can right. use the floater box across the whole table, basically. Um, we found that not only was the terrain different, but people in like uh, low-vis saturation zones, for example, 
Um, like people counted trees as saturation zones, yeah, which mm. is not something we had done before. Um, but it was really nice. People would before the, and I'm sure this is normal, but people before the game will talk about the map and agree on like, hey, is this a saturation zone? Is this, you know, how do we rule this? How are we gonna rule this? And it was really nice, just how collaborative everybody was. Um, and that kind of went throughout the whole game that people would agree on rules or kind of willing to explain rules even if you kind of fudged up. But um, but the terrain was. Yeah, it was weird. It was different than what we were used to, so it was nice to get a new experience and definitely a new experience to learn from. <laughs> yep. Uh, one of the big things I had in... One of the big reasons I think I got blown out so badly in my first game is because we have a lot of kind of very squarish, straight line terrain, and a lot of the stuff um, that we were playing with had, you know, weird angles, bits jutting out. Yep. And a lot of my, a lot of times when I thought I was in cover, I was not in cover, or I wasn't in full cover, and right. that right. led to me getting shot a lot because I just didn't quite realize that, you know, that's not a full wall. There's a little gap here, and that kind of stuff. So there was definitely a learning curve to having this new terrain and kind of having to internalize what actually do these things do, I guess. Right. In in the case of walls, like because sometimes walls have little cutouts, little holes in them. I think actually the walls that you might even be talking about are the ones on that Yujing table. They have little cutouts in them, no? Or yeah. Yeah, uh, but, yeah but and a lot of times what you'll do what people will do is uh, for instance that bridge actually is a great example because the bridge has like the railing on the side. And oftentimes we're getting you like, Do you want to play like as if it's opaque or see through where the rail is? Because it makes a difference if you can go prone behind it or not, essentially. Right. Uh, those are pretty common discussions, especially, like I said, for small cutouts on rails, small little cutouts on walls. Um, you know, obviously, I, I think the the default is, at, you know, you play it like it lies, right? But um, it is something that you definitely want to have a discussion on uh, at the beginning of the game. And then the, the trees being low vis saturation, in my experience, low vis saturation, is kind of the catch-all, like this is a terrain zone. It's low vis and sat done. Uh, you know, a lot of times, especially in N three, N three actually defined the interiors of buildings as saturation zones, yeah. right? Because like you're you're shooting through office furniture and all that. Um, you know, they're not always just empty warehouses. Mm -hmm. So, there that level of discussion is important. Um, one thing you can do. I designed cards for the Rose City Raid, I guess, two years ago. Um, they'll be using it again this year, where it has little like circles. Like, is it is it no vis penalty, low vis? Well, now there used to be different tiers of it. I don't even know if there are now, but like low vis, poor vis, zero vis, white noise. So it was like negative three, negative six, smoke or white noise. Right. Um, and then like what level of saturation it was, what level of difficulty it was for movement. Um, and what level of difficulty or dangerous it was back when that existed, but um, yeah, so you can you can make little reminders and stuff like that to help uh, future events. Yeah, that's that's the thing. But it is good to practice with terrain because it adds kind of an interesting element. Um, one one thing that I mean, this isn't a thing that happens in non-COVID times generally because people will generally bring the tables you play on a, on a, at a tournament to game night and you'll at least if you don't play on it you'll at least like you know maybe melanie plays on it, aaron doesn't but you can like go over and take a look at it and be like and then you know on the car ride home be like oh man that was terrible blah 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 and you can like talk through the details um so generally you don't see that at larger tournaments when you have to like somehow generate or like apparate 20 tables out of thin air somehow right then you'll get some like tables you've never seen from another meta and so there's a little bit of home field advantage where you'll see like people that play in Adam and Mai's meta that like um, see our tables all the time are very comfortable on them. And then people that come from far away, they're like, wait, the whole board is low vis saturation? Like, yeah, what's the big deal? What? Right? But like, so like, you'll, you'll see like crazy tables that are outside of your usual experience at, the, at, at, a, at a tournament, especially larger ones. That's totally normal. Um, it took me a second to remember which table you were talking about. And I was like, mm -hmm. right, the crashed airplane. Yeah. Uh, but so Adam and I generally try to show the tables that we'll be at 
the tournaments, especially for a city raid. Um, because we're not a satellite this year, right? I don't think so. Oh, there's no satellites this year. Yeah, there's no satellite this year. So when we are a satellite, we try to make sure that we say like, this table will be here. It's crazy. Be ready, right? So like things like that. Just so you guys know, tables that there are city raid are. <laughs> They're gonna be it's... bonkers. I. Mean, yeah. I... Yeah, it, it basically, like, part part of me even doing this event was, I don't think people use enough terrain in tournaments. I'm going to run a tournament, and it's going to have a lot of terrain. <laughs> and that's, like, not, their boards aren't crowded enough. Like, no, no, no. It's like, where's all the woods? Where, like, yeah. there used, like I said, there used to be, like, dangerous terrain rules where it's like you could roll up in this thing and get immobilized or take damage 13 hits or, like, here's a deactivated minefield. Let's hope they're all... They've all been detonated. Yep, my my table has mines on it. I don't know how we're gonna deal with that, but we'll, we'll put them back in. We'll find a way. We'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> yeah, like that used to be a thing. Minefields have enjoy. So, um, what was that? A lovely. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's better now. So before we go, do you do you have anything that you you wish you knew going into it? What uh, what little advice do you have for other new Infinity players going to their first event? Um, what, what I think we should... Yeah, one thing that kind of surprised us was uh, just playing lists we didn't know and playing all the armies we didn't know. Mm. Yeah. So it was helpful to... Um, well, it was a great learning experience to get our ass kicked by some new, uh, new factions. Um, one thing we did do was write the stuff we forget on a card beforehand. I um I can't ever remember to do metachemistry for my Morlocks. So oh. it was the top thing on my uh on an index card that you know I sat down at the beginning of the game, like, don't forget metachemistry, don't forget to do guts rolls, don't forget to do this, this, and this. Um, just so I so the things that I stumbled over, I was ready to go and actually play it right. Uh team leader tokens is another yeah, team leader tokens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, something that I discovered that was very nice is, you know, you're usually okay if you don't have every single token for every single thing because yeah. your opponent will probably have them. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, I I didn't realize I didn't have silhouette tokens and I needed them. Um, I'm going to be getting some, but it was totally fine that I didn't um, because other people had them to share and that wasn't a problem. Um, yeah, so people were very friendly about sharing tokens, cards, all kinds of, you know, whatever they had. Um, one thing that um, I think Obi posted in the tournament was bring courtesy lists. They're nice to have. They're nice to be able to give to your opponent. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, maybe going through army and finding what those big scary threats are is probably helpful because going up a hack tower, going up against a hack tower, I had no idea what it was. And then I got killed by it before I knew how to respawn. Whereas I went up against an avatar, I went, oh, I know what an avatar is and I have the tool to deal with it. So I was able to do that. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad that I knew what I was facing for a couple of my uh, lists and the time I didn't have any clue probably might have been helpful to know that uh, yeah, it's, it has nematism minus six and an HMG and, yep. and CO. And can that's go also a hard one, though, right? You roll up to Yu Jang and you're like, they've got a bunch of camo markers. Who knows what it is? And then it's like the hidden deploy thing that's 70 points is also there that you didn't know about. Yep. I mean, I've 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 got my butt thoroughly kicked by Swiss Guard in, in um uh, I'm totally brain for a name, name now. You just said it. Hawk Tower. I'm like, Yon Ho. Nope, that's the other thing. The Hawk Tower, like, yeah, no, it, it it happens. But it sounds like both of you actually do a very good job kind of, like, cultivating the beginner's mind, right? Like, you're going in with the goal of being educational. Um, and so, like, if, if you have that kind of attitude, you're always going to have a good time. Yeah. yeah. And, and one more, sorry. Go ahead. No, go for it. Uh, I was gonna say one more one more thing uh, about like not knowing all the armies or like going through army yourself. Um, ask your opponent, right, and be like, "Hey, uh, I'm I don't know Yu Jing at all. Uh, I tried to look through it. I don't. I haven't. I couldn't digest it. What's the scariest thing I should be like aware of, right?" And they'll be like, "Oh, um, 
uh, we have drop troops. Uh, there's like crazy high BS things with mimetism minus six that have hidden deployment that exist. Um, yeah, drop troops that ex drop troops that explode. Right, those are things you need to be concerned about. Um, so I, I like a perfect example. I did this against uh, a buddy of mine who came. Over, James came over today to play, and he's never really faced Merovingia before, and he hasn't played in a year. And I was like, okay, just so you mm -hmm. know, there's a dog warrior that can come on at your deployment zone edge. Just saying. And also, <laughs> like, there's flamethrowers under any of these camo tokens. He was like, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we didn't ask that exact question, which would have been really helpful. Um, but people were totally willing to do things like, hey, what's hackable in your list? Um, right. And yeah. give those kind of pieces of information that are useful to know. Or, like, what has MSV kind of yeah. questions? Yeah. So they know well, their is... stuff really well, just like you know your stuff. So right. you know, use them as a as a as as a Google, right? A searchable database. Yeah, and just you know, I think one main thing is just you will be able to talk to your opponents. They will probably be nice people. So yeah, chat with them and they will help you out. Very cool. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us. This evening, it is still an evening, right? It's 10 o'clock yeah. tonight, just a different day. I don't know what's going on, man. This is live. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for coming on, giving us the, the breakdown of your first tournament, um, <laughs> really just giving us the new player perspective, which is so valuable, right? Like, I'm so happy that, you know, we were able to intercept you at this stage of your development <laughs> and, like, ask you questions, right? <laughs> like... We just want to know, like, because there's a lot of other people out there who are new players, and it's easy for us to give the veteran perspective, but we cannot give the new player perspective anymore. Like, we just can't. We're not that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, thank you so much for being uh, the voice for that community. Um, any other new players out there that are interested in talking to us, let us know. Mailbag at war late night wargames dot com. Uh, hit us. Apparently, Bromad Academy missions are helpful. Uh -huh. so shameless self plug there. Uh, but yeah, thank you both for taking the time out for doing this and for being our guinea pig for uh, for um, recorded segments. So we hope to do more of these in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This has been fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. All right. Well, John, I'm Adam. Back to you. Hey, it's back to us. OMG. Hey. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, us. And, was a, and, uh, and Aaron and Melanie for for giving us the the lowdown on uh, all the tournament stuff. So hopefully that was fun. Hopefully that was good. Um, uh, you know, if you if you like the way we did things there, let us know. If you think we can improve somehow, let us know that too. Um, yeah, I I really think that was um, pretty seamless on our end. I feel like just just. Yeah, any suggestions, audio quality, video quality, any of that stuff. Yeah. Let us know. Please, please help um, us. I think, you know, this is really a format that lets us, like we mentioned earlier, um, find people that aren't available at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> Pacific. Uh, you know, so specifically people with, you know, in the UK, in Europe, that's where, you know, a lot of game developers are. And we'd like to have them on the show. I know that the people at Moonstone have expressed interest in coming on. Uh, the people over at War Cradle have expressed interest in coming on. So, uh, you know, this also might even let us get some of the folks over at Corvus Valley on. So we'll we'll definitely, uh, you know, try this format again in the future and keep trying to bring on interesting guests for everyone to experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you've wasted another perfectly good evening listening to Late Night War Games. Uh, All right. right I'll take it away. <laughs> so... Uh, just a reminder, we got two Bromad Academy missions. One is limited insertion. Take a 10 a model count uh, combat group. Play it. Oh, sorry, list, I guess I should say. Play it. Let us know how it went. Uh, you can paint up a conversion you made also for Bromad Academy. Lumbering Sprocket, we've got a bunch of missions there as well. Uh, literally, we've got three of them. Try out the heavy, uh, heavy Gear Blitz Tournament System, HGBTS. It's always hard to say. Easy to type. Um, so those are things. Uh, we've got some, I've got some battle reports coming on MercuryCon. Now you can check out. Um, there are still some Rose City Raid tickets, yes, I believe. There's... We're down to the last five. Last Actually, five Rose City Raid tickets. Uh, we've got our, our ringer spot is secured. 
Uh, so, you know, that's gone to Jeremy. Uh, we're going to look forward to hanging out with him. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank There's you no very idea much. How important that is. Yeah, it's it's super it important. Letting us like not stress about having to you know dive in and stop toing and uh, uh, to have enough bandwidth to, to run for a forty play person tournament is really important. Um, you can find us here every Tuesday night at eight thirty p.m. Pacific on Twitch. We upload everything to your favorite podcast apps and to YouTube on the following day. Um, if you like what you see here and you want to support us, you can uh, do so and become a late night war gamer on Patreon. Uh, get some access to some cool benefits like uh, some secret channels on our Discord server. A chance to come on the show. Um, yeah, I guess uh, thanks to all of our sponsors, right? So Dream Pod Nine, Mythic Games, Carver's Belly Board, and Brew War Cradle Studios and Brutal Cities. Uh, you'll see some more Dystopian Wars content from us soon. And uh, next week's episode is Heavy Gear Beyond the Box Part Two. We're talking about Caprice, PRDF, and Utopia. Right. So those are the last three armies that have. Uh, plastic starter sets that you can, you know, pick up and then add a couple of kits to that we give some suggestions and build out your list. So be sure to catch us on Facebook, YouTube, any of your podcasts. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to give us a five star rating on iTunes. Follow us on Twitch and YouTube. And all of this helps us bring you the best content that we can. And with that, thanks you for joining us and we will see you next week. Good night, everyone. Won't you play games with me? And I like to do everyone. That's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. That's what I really like to do. That's what I really like to do.